Hey guys, welcome back to the Prehistoric Life Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Crawford, and today we have another interview. He's down there. It's the dude from Fossil Trips. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah. Uh, Zach Finoss, founder, director of Dinosaur Trips, uh, a company that uh, does exactly what it sounds like it does. We create trips around the world focused on fossils, paleontology, and dinosaurs. What more do you need? <laughs> what more do you need, right? <laughs> and I forgot to say it. That's their Instagram, so go check that out. That's where they post. I'm sure they have a TikTok and things. I just don't have that on my laptop. So go check out their Instagram. That's where they I found them at. I mean, yeah, that's uh, the best so, spot. That's the best spot to find us probably for for trip updates and images and everything else. Obviously, dinosaurtrips.com. But uh, yeah, in the social space, the Instagram is the most active for sure right now for us. So. One of the most basic questions that I start off every interview with, it's turned into a tradition, and there is the website. Just do a segue. There that is. Oh, it doesn't say the search bar. But there's a website, just fossil trip or dinosaur trips.com. I have called your company like eight different things. I've called it like <laughs> paleo trips, dinosaur trips, fossil trips. Hey, they all, they're all reflective of what we do. So as long as you get the website right when you're searching for it, you know, dinosaur trips, fossil trips, paleo trips, they all do underline what it is that we're up to out here. And we're the only ones doing it, so. So, <laughs> back to what I was saying before it awkwardly loaded in. Um, what is your favorite dinosaur? I've always been a Brachiosaurus guy. That's where, that's where I started. I mean, it came from... Uh, Land Before Time being a big influence on me when I was a kid that came out when I was very, very young. Um, and I recognize Littlefoot is not a Brachiosaurus, but the long necks were the first ones I was drawn to. Uh, and then, you know, as my education on dinosaurs as a kid became a little stronger and I learned different species and whatnot, the biggest and the best being the Brachiosaurus, that scene in Jurassic Park, I mean, that sealed the deal for me. That was the one that I collected the stickers of as a kid. That was the one that I was always, always the biggest fan of. Uh, for some reason, didn't go carnivorous like the bigger before. Still do. I mean, whales or whales and elephants are amongst my favorite living animals. So the bigger, the better. For some reason, for me. So that way. <laughs> so confused on that. Um, got a little brachiosaurus over here. I mean, nice. Nothing like a sauropod. So I'm, I am fascinated with sauropods. I got a few, but they're kind of higher up, and I just don't want to knock everything down yet. <laughs> the life of. Dino nerd, yet. yeah, exactly. The, the collectible. <laughs> There's so, something about collecting and dinosaur interest that definitely go hand in hand. So I get it. <laughs> and your shelves get way too full, and then you're like, I need to get to the back now. How do I do that? <laughs> so, would you like to talk about what y'all do on dinosaur trips? Yeah, I mean, we do a whole variety of trips. We launched, we're, we're a brand new company. We launched um, officially, I guess, in November of 2021, but more earnestly in uh, in the beginning of 2020, uh, sorry, November 2022, but more earnestly uh, January 2023. So we're just pretty much exactly a year old as we're having this conversation. We did our first trips uh, in last year, this last summer, we went out to the Badlands of Alberta, got a dinosaur dig in there uh, with Dr. Philip Curry, who, you know, people who are fans of paleontology definitely know that name. Uh, we did Chicago for what we were calling uh, pickaxes and pitchforks, which was a, we did a music festival plus a field museum. So, uh, and a bit of a city expedition there. Uh, and we're really expanding now. We got two trips coming up this spring into the U.S. We're doing um, California and Arizona on a trip we're calling Route 66 million years ago. We've got a trip coming up right after that, and they can be paired together. Colorado and Utah, we're calling Red Rocks and Raptors. We're returning for three trips to uh, the Badlands of Alberta this summer, two for people 12 and up that will be doing a day with the Philip J. Curing Museum again, getting out to Dinosaur Provincial Park. Uh, and we got some family trips on, on coming up as well in North America and Montana and uh, the aforementioned Alberta. And then we're going international in 2024 as well mm -hmm. with trips to uh, Patagonia, uh, deep down at the bottom of South America there and Chile and Argentina and, uh, and as well as expanding into Australia. So uh, a big year coming up for dinosaur trips as we head uh, 
so many places. Each of the trips is a little bit different for obvious reasons. I mean, the two trips that we've got coming up, uh, I know, I believe we've had Dr. Brian Curtis as a guest on the, on the podcast before of Fossil Crates. He's leading two of our trips to, uh, he's le leading the two Southern U.S. trips, our kind of Wild West experiences. Get, you know, and he's going to get us just incredible access to these museums, access to the behind the scenes places that if you're just a regular museum visitor, you don't get to see. He's going to be with us throughout the trip to expand upon anything we learn getting us up close and personal with the fossils uh in ways that your your regular guests can't get we're going to do universal studios do the jurassic world ride there as well and then you know for for the alberta digs for the yeah, for patagonia trip uh australia we're actually going to get hands-on experience doing genuine dinosaur digs on those as well so each destination we make sure that whatever it is that we're visiting, you know, we really do the best of the destination as well. So if we're headed down to Arizona, California, you're going to do some desert hikes. You're going to do the Grand Canyon, Joshua Tree and all that stuff. Uh, Los Angeles, you know, we're we're going to visit LA proper. We're going to do some fine dining. Alberta, we're going to get that. I, I know a lot of Americans don't necessarily know that Alberta is is kind of our, our Wild West province. It's the Canadians tend to call it the Texas of Canada. So we do the Wild West experience there in the Canadian Rockies, horseback riding, go deep in the caves. So yeah, we do a lot of paleo stuff the paleo nerd will always be satisfied uh but we want people to be able to come on these trips as well who maybe have family or a partner or best friend who they want to travel with uh maybe not quite as enthusiastic about paleontology there's a lot in these trips for them and we know based on experience now especially uh if you come in even with just a oh dinosaurs are cool but i don't know much about them uh you'll come out being like man i'm i'm all in on this dig experience i'm all in on the museums i get this now and it really uh kind of takes you to the next level in that paleontology level we had people who are just you know archaeology enthusiasts they've done digs of that nature before coming with us last year and they came away going oh my god i didn't even know what you know a sauropod was before this thing started and now i'm all in buy me my buy me the books i'm coming to patagonia too we're doing the whole thing so so i mean so i guess y'all are stationed out or well, I guess for me, up in Canada. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm Canadian. Uh, the, we're an Alberta-based company. Um, Thought so. And so that's where that's where things all started for us. Um, my I I live in Toronto myself, um, but wanted to. I had never been out to the Badlands of Alberta as a kid and a dinosaur enthusiast. You know, uh, my uncle went out there on a motorbike trip and sent some stuff back and I, my mind was just blown i didn't even think that existed in canada you know i had no idea as a five-year-old that, that we could find dino bones in canada and but it was a 35 year 36 year odyssey to actually finally getting out there and experiencing myself and and i wanted people to be able to do that I wanted people to recognize you know oh my god there's this amazing paleontology tourism opportunity in canada and uh and yeah, now we've expanded internationally, going to the U.S., going to South America, uh, going to Australia, to kind of continue to do that same thing. But yeah, we're based we're based in Canada. We're based our our offices in Calgary. That's kind of that's kind of the jumping off point. And you know, that's the first one that we're doing multiple trips to as well. It's really rare. I mean, I was I, despite being the person organizing the trips and hosting them, uh, getting out to Dinosaur Provincial Park and getting up to like the Pipestone Creek Bone Bed there that we did uh, for our dig with the Philip J. Curie Museum. Um, blew my mind like you, you you have certain expectation and it was just the next level we walked out and within 10 minutes you know our fossil hunter for day one is picking up and showing us you know, pieces of a spine of a theropod and stuff it was it was so cool i mean dinosaurs are already impressive creatures but like finding them all over the world i feel like is what makes them even more special exactly i mean i think that the uh, there's a certain you know if you're a hobbyist like me, who's just, the interest was on that. You know, I'm curious about dinosaurs. I want to, you know, mm -hmm. Steve Brissati comes out with a book. I'm definitely reading that. I'm following, you know, your account and all the other compelling social media accounts, but I'm not, I'm not a paleontologist. I'm not, I don't even have much of a science background in any degree since high school. Um, but, you know, I've, I've maintained interest throughout, but uh, you kind of don't realize, I mean, we know dinosaurs rolled the earth, right? That's, that's a saying we all do. Mm -hmm. 60, 200 million years ago and dinosaurs were on the earth but they were on the whole earth like unless it's a new island that has come up in the last 65 million years there were dinosaurs there and even if that island did come up there's a good chance there's marine life that we find at the same time there's just it's such an for me it's been an exciting way to look at the globe now and say okay where are we going why are we going there letting paleontology and, and and dinosaurs kind of be our our compass and where we're going to go and and you just get this sense of how many species there were and the different 
geographies that they lived in, the different environments that they inhabited. And imagining, you know, there's one thing to go to the Badlands in the U.S. or in Canada or even down to Patagonia and, and envision it as it is now. Uh, but it's, you know, you really kind of expand the destination, what it is, and imagining what it's looked like 200 million years ago, 100 million years ago, when it was, you know, some of these places were just at the bottom of an ocean or were, you know, were out in the desert and the prairies. And you're like, well, this used to be, you know, right along the ocean. This would have been prime property if you were investing in it today. And you start to kind of, uh, it, it shapes your understanding of not just the destination you're visiting, but the whole world uh, and the history and the, the dynamic history of our planet through time and how much it's changed and you start to you know you get to dip into the geology of a destination you get to dip into the paleontology culture of a destination you know certainly with the experiences that we're doing in north america you're looking at the first nations experience how did they interpret dinosaurs when they were obviously finding them all over the place when you're out there you can see how easy it is you know for for a group that was traveling across the badlands or across the prairies that you inevitably are going to stumble on some fossils and what did they what was their interpretation how did that inform in their culture it's all really exciting because yeah i'm on the well, maybe east coast <laughs> think about that <laughs> i'm on the east coast so we don't get many of the huge dinosaurs like t-rex and allosaurus and brachiosaurus and parasaurolophus and yada 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 etc we get like shark teeth mosasaur teeth mosasaur fossils uh we do get some mammals but we love those two, but it's really good <laughs> um, so in, um, what was his name? The Russian archeologist, I was talking to him and he was talking about how like they'll come across like, um, native American things, uh, where it'll be like a pot and it'll have like, like a Megalodon tooth in it, or it'll be jewelry. And there's like a Megalodon tooth incorporated into it because it was like, seen as like a ritualistic thing like it was like a like a sign of some sort that you find this thing just like washed up on on shore and i mean i i could only imagine what like whatever tribe was out there whenever they find a t-rex skull and they're like uh <laughs> i hope this thing's not still alive <laughs> that's a good i've never i've never considered that part they're like wait is this around still is this something we have to contend with right now should we be nervous about this <laughs> no it's for sure and i mean you know obviously this is if be it be it a russian paleontologist or archaeologist um obviously you know across china there's huge pot paleontology finds being found now uh, in the outback of australia where you would have had indigenous cultures interacting cultures of any you know what what what's found on the east coast of the united states through new jersey and jurassic coast of the uk um it's it's something that i think from the very start of us as we as we started to encounter these fossils has made us wonder about the history of our planet in some way you know when you're finding these giant bones these skulls these teeth from creatures that to the best of your knowledge and do not exist anymore you really it, it starts to unlock a lot of like okay there's a time before us there's things that have come in the past uh, how do we interpret that so i think that's you know there's there's while paleontology is in as a science is not that old i think people have been contemplating this idea obviously for since we've probably ten thousand years you know since we started kind of encountering these things and wondering about them and probably starting with that initial reaction that you said there is like uh do i need to worry about this and you know with time putting further thought and prizing these finds as, as, you know, we have them in museums or private collections today, but I think they've always been prized. It's like, oh my God, this is a tremendous find. This is something to be proud of and examined and studied and considered, you know? Because from like my research, like you said, <clears throat> on like, on the paleontology scale, not old. Paleontologists, humans aren't old. No, we're like, just here, just arrived. <laughs> I mean, but like, as like, human standards it's it's been around for two or three hundred years be like the 19th century give or take mm -hmm. is whenever paleontology was coined as a phrase or used and i mean that wasn't even like picking up until like later on i mean no. uh, like one of the most famous events the bone wars i mean that really picked up and made dinosaur like a household name i mean and then later on in life whenever you have things like Jurassic Park coming on and then they start having like their sequels and they start making more movies even like the more recent ones like Jurassic World I mean when they come out they kind of 
reintroduce dinosaurs back into the populace. I mean, and I mean, that's, that's just like an amazing thing to like witness. I mean, no, it, it definitely is. And it's something that, you know, I, in starting this company, I, I thought about a lot because it, it, it's a leap to start a company, certainly. Um, and you definitely. have to have some confidence in, in, in what you're doing and you know, it, this didn't exist. So there was no real reason for me to say this is definitely going to work um, because there was no proof of concept out there from other people doing this kind of thing. But to speak to what you were just saying, you know, you look at human history, um, certainly even, you know, the more recent history of our experience with the idea of paleontology uh, to the bone wars and, the, you know, that was massive entertainment um, yeah. in, in the Gilded Age. People were really into it and, and dinosaurs unlocked something in the imagination. And, you know, the, not just Jurassic Park, which was obviously a phenomenon and continues to fuel paleontology today in a lot of ways, because a lot of us who came up on that movie, you know, were really inspired by it. But it, like, I've got a history, you know, as I said, I'm not a paleontologist. I did study creative arts in school and whatnot. And so I did a lot of film courses and what was compelling even then was, the moment that we had, were able to make movies uh, with any sort of special effects, one of the first things we did was, okay, let's put dinosaurs in them. You know, those first King Kong movies have dinosaurs in them. So the moment that, we, that we've been kind of, anytime we take a leap in some sort of technology forward in our entertainment alone, we tended to look at dinosaurs. I mean, that's what Steven Spielberg and his gang with Philip Tippett and all them did on Jurassic Park was, it was this brand new technology that they kind of unleashed and they said, Let's do, or I guess it was almost the inverse. We're doing dinosaurs. Let's unlock this technology. But it's it's something that captures our imagination. And, you know, in communicating with people, oh, why would I be interested in a dinosaur trip? You know, that seems a little nerdy. Maybe that ain't for me. That's just what I keep coming back to is like, okay, but take a look around in pop culture at any given moment or just the general culture. There's dinosaur representation everywhere, especially with kids, but not just with children, everywhere all the time. People are excited by the idea of dinosaurs, even if you're not, you know, on the nerd level into it, even if you don't have any understanding of paleontology or know the difference between, you know, the various eras of the Jurassic, Cretaceous, Triassic, whatever it may be. There's something exciting about them. And when I start talking about it with people, when you take people to a museum, and certainly when you take people on a fossil dig, um, that excitement is inherent no matter how much your initial interest was. It, it's just, oh, this is the, these are giant creatures from ancient times. Uh, and that's exciting. Yeah, that's part of their beauty. I mean, half of it is like, like the most famous example is like Brontosaurus. You're like, Oh, look at this big thing. And you're like, as you just like, as it goes on, as they find stuff, you're like, that thing looks weird. That thing looks off. It looks wrong. And then like a whole thing has to change. Like, like the head was wrong. So they replace it. And then the species didn't exist for a while. And then it was given to another species. And then now they find new studies and they're like, oh, well, now there's all these other studies, like, like the feather theory, the lip theory. And things like that that are coming out and you can apply it to older studies which makes it more like more and more interesting yeah and i mean i'm sure your audience obviously knows that we're making these discoveries all the time that, that advancements are being made in paleontology all the time it's a constantly evolving um science but i think the general population I, i'm confident the general population kind of st still believes that uh, we've discovered everything there is to discover about dinosaurs. That book is closed. Um, you know, you can open it any time and do some learning on the things from the past, but we're we're all done with dinosaurs as far as new discoveries go. And, and you know, that's something that's really fun to communicate to people is, no, nah, this is, we're almost in a golden age for starters of paleontology and we'll never be done. It's a science. We'll never, you know, this is a study of things that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. We're never going to have a full picture. We're always going to be learning. There's always something new to discover in the field. And oftentimes it can be, you know, paradigm shifting. It, it, not only is this a stayed, not a stayed science, it's, it's often evolving in leaps and bounds and our complete understanding is changing all the time. So, like, I mean, like, like you were saying, like people think we're all done, but from like, just like a quick Google search, because honestly, I didn't know this information off the top of my head. Um, I, I just looked up how many species of dinosaur do we know and estimated vary with, uh, but in terms of non-avian dinosaurs, about 300 valid, uh, like, uh, genre, but roughly like 700 valid species. And that's like less than 3%. Of oh, like yeah. all species. No, for sure. I mean, when you consider 
I mean, that we do not live currently in an age of, you know, the most biodiverse in this planet's history by any stretch of the imagination. And then you consider, you know, how long it's been since the ice age when this, when our, when our current kind of biodiversity began to deform uh, as we understand it today, really. Then you consider, you know, the hundreds of millions of years that the, that the age of dinosaurs spanned. Um, it's, you, 3% might be very generous. You know, there's just so much out there very to be discovered. And you'll hear people say like, well, how is it possible that we find things that have been, you know, it, it, it takes pretty special circumstances to create a fossil. So how is it that we're finding so many? And, you know, the answer is always because it's hundreds of millions of years, billions, trillions of, of individual creatures. So, you know, some of them are going to end up in these special circumstances that fossilized. Um, most of them did not. The vast, 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 vast majority of them did not. But there were just so many. There's so many species, so many individual animals that have existed over the course of, and across this very specific course of time. It's, you know, of course, there's going to be plenty that we do find simply because they, the numbers are mind boggling of how many would have existed. You know, I just I was watching Prehistoric Planet. Uh, or no, sorry, rather, uh, Life on Earth, the Netflix program with some friends and, and you know, talking about our experiences in Alberta last summer and just kind of getting the context of this, imagine, like, it's easy to imagine a Triceratops, for instance. I mean, thanks to the fact that that's one of the ones we've been seeing since our imagination started with dinosaurs. Um, you know, Jurassic Park certainly solidified that. But then imagining, hold on, put this in the context of these herds that the same way that we have herds of, of any of our herbivores traveling across the savanna today where there's tens of thousands and imagine them all moving together. Um, it, it, you know, I always see people have a reaction to that of like, oh, oh, wow, that, you know, that really is something, th these weren't individual creatures walking around the forest by themselves. This is, this is, it's another unlocking of what really existed on this planet at some point. And even people get excited about it. Cause they always show like every dinosaur, like some kind of solitary creature, like, yeah. like a bear or something. It's, but it's like, these things would have been more like an elephant or a rhino and they would have lived in herds and they would have stayed in one area and migrated together. And they probably had other species around with them. Like, yeah. like, like you said, Triceratops probably had some sort of uh hadrosaur or maybe, maybe like an ankylosaurus or two ankylosaurid of, or some kind just around maybe not with it but like near it but yeah so, oh absolutely i mean you look at you look at our, our at any of the modern environments and the way animals live i mean specifically i think everyone easily thinks you know out to the savannah and how it is out there i mean you watch the, the giant wildebeest migrations or the zebra migrations they're, they're happening with many other creatures and species you know, right beside them, moving with them, moving behind them. These are migrations that happen together. And there's really no reason to believe there would have been any other way that it, these dinosaurs would have done that. These are not, mm -hmm. you know, one-off creatures. I mean, some of them were. We have our, we have individual animals today. But yeah, they, these were complex environments um, with all these creatures interacting. And that was one of those things that, you know, captivated my mind as a child. I always loved those paintings that I know now are not scientifically accurate, you know, because this was, I was looking at them in the eighties and the early nineties, but they were still very compelling to me as a kid and still uh, ignite my imagination today as an adult is, is this idea, this concept of all these creatures living together, you know, you've got that watering hole with the littlest, tiniest dinosaur and the Brachiosaurus in the background and the carnivore. And yeah, it wouldn't, if you snapped a picture, it wouldn't have probably looked like that in, in the Cretaceous period necessarily, but it's a good representation. And it, I think it unlocks the imagination of, of these more than just as individual species, but as, as this environment of creatures and, and not just creatures, but botany and everything else that interacted with it. And, you know, when you're visiting a destination like we do, um, it's fun to kind of think about, oh man, Arizona did not look like this 200 million years ago. Oh, it's completely yeah, no. different. But how does how it looked 200 million years ago shape what it looks like now, what we experience now? And the fact that, you know, in Alberta, even because um, that's oil country here in Canada, my guests were particularly excited to learn like, oh, there's so much oil here because of the what the land was like 200, 300 million years ago, or what the ocean that was here at the time, you know, splitting North American half was like at the time that it's things that you don't want to maybe a, a high level, but don't ever engage with. And it just starts to unlock so much more about, you know, 
So the dinosaurs and the flora and fauna that were here uh, in the Cretaceous and Jurassic period influenced the fact that all these people are out here digging for oil now. Um, and it's just, it's fun to kind of just see how there's a lineage, no matter how long ago something was, it still informs the, the culture of, an, of a destination today. I mean, you were talking about just like the environment that doesn't just like affect things like, like now, I mean, it affected the animals that lived in it. Like a lack of tall trees probably meant that there weren't any sauropods in that area, but like, large groups of like shrub or something probably meant something more like uh stegosaurus or triceratops or uh hadrosaur i keep getting stumped on that one for some reason but if you have things like hadrosaurs and triceratops around you probably had a predator to balance it out so you get things like t-rex and uh other large predators like later on albertosaurus and uh nonaquisaurus and far north alaska i mean they were everywhere and there are some that we probably have permanently lost to time and we just don't know it oh absolutely there's i mean there's got to be you know an unthinkable amount of species that we'll never find um a, a single trace of but to speak to what you're just saying there i mean that was one of the most i think exciting things being out in, in pipestone creek up in grand prairie in wimbley alberta that we were unlocking was so this is a very, very dense bone bed, one of the, maybe the densest in the world up there. Um, and so, you know, when you're digging through the rock and dirt to find the fossils there, you're less spending time moving rock and dirt off the fossils themselves than fossils off fossils, because it's just, it was this giant herd that likely was caught in the middle of a flood, um, flooded over, they all drowned like thousands thousands of these herbivores all drowned uh, and then likely that water went away carnivores came along pulled at them you know took time so there was fossilization probably took place in a couple si situations um, where they were unearthed and re refound and so what my guest and I, myself as well particularly found interesting out there was as we're doing this you know so yes we're we're learning about the pachyrhinosaurs that are the dominant species that you're finding bones on bones on bones here in this bed. But you're also finding teeth from little theropods. You're finding, you know, uh, plant life from that era as well. And you start to unpack that thing we were just talking about, that whole picture. And I think, you know, for my guess in particular, it's like, oh, right, you just don't find, it's not just one species or that you're finding, you know, it, this is the, 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 you know, the teeth from the carnivores, that you're finding in there aren't because they drowned in that same moment, but they came over. They've been tearing at the carcasses. They're losing teeth in it. And you start to really get a sense of who was around during this period. What were they up to? What was this, what was this region like? I mean, obviously this had to be a massive herd. If we're finding, you know, thousands of fossils from these pachyrhinosaurs, maybe that herd was 10 times larger in actuality. So when you imagine that mass of dinosaurs, um, obviously that's going to bring a ton of carnivores along with it. Obviously that's going to bring insects along with it and so many other things. Uh, so it, it, it's just fun to, you know, when you get to the dig site, you realize, oh, we're, yeah, a lot of the time, certainly you're probably just finding one species and you're, and you're doing the look at them, but there is opportunity to start to unlock the world around it, uh, that would have existed there and understand how that, how that would have been put together. It's really, it's fun. It's putting a puzzle together. It's unlocking your imagination in ways that, you know, it brings a lot to the table, I think putting a puzzle together but you're missing half the pieces and oh you're missing most of the pieces around exactly <laughs> yeah and i mean like you're saying with like a flood i mean that's also not like it, it's not like something just struck them down now they're dead i mean that would have moved the body smaller ones probably would have been thrown away i mean yeah it, it moves them i mean so you get something where they're all in one area probably where the water just carried all of them and yes, so, that's exactly it. Yeah, it's not even necessarily that this bone bed was where they actually died. It could they could have easily or likely been washed further down through this this whatever it was this flash flood, which is only a theory. I mean, with it, nobody actually knows what killed them all, but that seems likely compared to as you say. We it's a puzzle that we don't have many of the pieces. You just you have to kind of use guesswork and and past knowledge and and observations of how our world is today to to start to put this picture together. And I mean. Like you're saying, species come on, they feed on that, they rip it apart, they move limbs from other places. So you get 
maybe a dinosaur with another dinosaur's leg and it just and exactly it just doesn't quite match but it seems like it goes together and that's because it's like similar but not the same and i mean because you can look at the picture of like eight triceratops and they might look very similar but they're all still like unique like each one is still unique it had its own set of bones it had its own set of skin it had its own set of muscle just like people i mean and that's also something that's makes you think so interesting is whenever you get like a dense bone bed like that, you get that like confusion of like the uniqueness of each individual part, but they're all just on top of each other. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, that there's something fun about the history of that, where, you know, before we knew what we know now in paleontology, people were putting random pieces together that maybe are from completely different creatures. But, you know, it's easy to laugh at that now, at the, you know, the quote unquote unicorns that they would put together in some of those early museums. Uh, but then, you know, we have to be aware that in 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, I mean, even the dinosaurs I was into as a child, um, the evolution of that has been has been massive. So it's it's easy to look back and go like, man, that was silly. What were they thinking? But, you know. People are going to do that to, to what we know right now, for sure, as well. I mean, like, just here, I don't even know where I got them from. But I got some of the, like, old-school, more iconic-looking dinosaurs. Let me turn that camera on first. I mean, like, that thing is, like, horribly inaccurate now that you look at it. But it's still, like, just one of those things. I mean, you can tell where, like, where they thought that they existed like that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And there's definitely like, like I mean, one of the like the first dinosaur, the first dinosaur, Megalosaurus. I mean, I, that's probably for me. It, it's not necessarily my favorite dinosaur, but it's probably the best one to look at to see the evolution of the theories, because it's kind of been affected by all of that. So I mean, it started out as like the weird four-legged creature with a horn on its nose or whatever. I mean. Oh, I think that was like one and on, but which is another one. I mean, yeah. And you can see how it evolves. After a time, it gained feathers, and now they're thinking that it had lips. And and I mean, it's like you can see that, like, as discoveries come, we even go back and change what we know about other other species. Yeah, no, it's in constant evolution. It's a constant conversation. There's always something to be learned, and you don't have to be a paleontologist or or you know really. Obs- deep into this stuff to understand it i mean in the i like many people you know kind of abandoned uh my penchant for paleontology in my teenage years of sports and music and girls all came along and caught my interest and plus you know it seemed nerdy so i put that aside but in my late 20s and early 30s when i when i revisited my interest in this and reignited my passion for paleontology um one of the things i was worried was like all right, I didn't study paleontology. My last science class came in, you know, 1999 or something. Um, am I going to have any ability to continue to follow along? Is this some, you know, is this all so stodgy and academic that, uh, you know, outside of learning about a couple of new species names or learning that some dinosaurs had feathers that we previously didn't think, is there anything to it? And it's not, it's not the case at all. I mean, one, there's enough pop science interest in this that you can find people who are doing a fantastic job translating what is the academia what is the you know the science the latin names yada 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 into very understandable ways i mean you talking about the lips conversation which overtook paleontology twitter and and conversation for a little bit in in a con in kind of controversial ways and got people a little heated but you know for me the layman out there i still understood what the conversation was about um I, i still understood the different representations so there's a lot of ways into this without having to know, um, you know, without having to know everything, without having to have a degree in paleontology and geology. That it, it, it's a nice, comfortable space now, which you know I don't think was necessarily the case 20, 30 years ago. Where if you if you're a hobbyist like myself, you can still understand. You know, you can. There's plenty of people who are helping to bridge that gap between academia and the layman. And I mean, you know, Dr. Brian Curtis, who's leading our, our our trips to the Southwest of, of fossil crates. He's one of those people who does a really good job of that. Um, and so, you know, and, and that's why we wanted him to be leading these dinosaur trips is we, we need people who can understand it at the highest level and are on the cutting edge of it and are in the know and can get us that access, but also then can take all that information and access and privilege and go, 
and here's what that means. Here's how I can explain Actually, that to you yeah. in a way that understands. And here's some examples from our modern world that can help you better appreciate what it was going on at the time. And so, you know, that's what I'm having a lot of fun with is, is, is bringing it down to the, the accessible level that everybody can get a little, you know, Fossil Grace does a great job with taking finds that you would never get to hold in your hand necessarily and making cast and, and making it very tangible. And I feel like what Dinosaur Trips is doing is a little bit of an extension of that, which is let's make all of, you know, let's, how can we make it beautiful? Like how do we make yeah. paleontology more tangible or hold it in your hands, stand on the vistas, look out at the dig sites, put that hammer in the ground yourself. You know, it's, a, it's not, there's not a wall between your, everyday person in paleontology if you're looking in the right places it's very accessible and interesting to everybody I, I feel like there are a few sciences that probably are ever so slightly easier than <laughs> paleontology and that's probably something like just like you just look down and you're just like dirt <laughs> identifying things like that is it's probably easier than paleontology and that's sure. technically science but I don't want to, I'm not throwing shade at paleontology, but it is definitely on the easier side of some sciences compared to things like astrophysics and people who put people in space. I mean, people who study all that, I'm like, I don't even know where I would begin. I don't no, even know where you sure. would start on any of that. And I start to look at that and I, I just feel like my brain just shutting off when I read anything related to that. I'm like, I how did you know there was a star doing this that caused it? I'm like, where did this come from? I'm like what, what gamma rays is it putting off now? No, I agree entirely. Like I love, I love physics. I find it very compelling and interesting in the same way that I find paleontology interesting. Um, so, you know, I take, I, I get those books that are kind of entry level to introduce the concepts to myself and try to get an understanding. And I find it all very fun to learn about and consider and think about and have conversations about with friends but reading, you know, how time works or how the universe functions is my brain's not wired Very that way. I, I admire people who can do it. It's incredible. Uh, my brain just doesn't, you know, I'll read about the concepts and go, okay, I think I can understand that to talk to somebody else about like, isn't this interesting that we think this, but I can't conceptualize it really. I don't have a good understanding. And if, you know, remove one step away and ask me to explain it without literally saying kind of what I read, um, you know, take another oh, angle on it. No, no, I can't do that. Paleontology though, uh, you know, if you're interested in wildlife in the modern world, if you're, you know, have any in interest in understanding animals or whatever it may be, biology, but and not even on the studied it in school level. Paleontology has access points. We understand what bones are. You know, it's tangible. You can hold it. We understand how our bodies work in a certain way. Uh, I think, we, you know, we all have a little bit more ability to conceptualize the world of paleontology than we do some of these much more abstract sciences. Um, whereas, yeah, paleontology, it's, it's a very tangible science. Um, it, even the concepts, you know, at their most abstract are still being considered in a tangible observational way in the world that we currently live in. They're very, it's a very hands-on study yeah exactly a lot of a lot of these other ones aren't really like that it's more just an observation and i think that's another thing it's like i personally am not one of those people that can sit behind a desk and stare into a telescope for 40 hours in a week i would lose my mind i i personally would just go crazy after a while and be like i can't do this i gotta go do something else but paleontology is that one thing is that each of these creatures are so abstract and they're so unique and they each have their own specialization that it, they're fun to look at they're fun to put together they're fun to find they're fun to theorize about and figure yeah. out how they do this and that and you can actually go out and find it and you can physically do something it gets you physically active it gets you mentally active i mean and who doesn't like looking at a dinosaur i mean <laughs> exactly that's what I that's what I say to people, you know, who are like, oh, it's a very niche travel company you put together. I'm like, okay, but dinosaurs cool, right? And they're like, oh yeah, dinosaurs are cool. So it's, it's, it's a starting great. point. It's really a starting point. Like, there's very few people who I've encountered um, who are just like, nah, no dinosaurs for me, dog. Not interested. Don't talk to me about it. Don't want to. Don't want to see that at any moment. Like, they're they're compelling them almost no matter who you are to some degree. You have some appreciation. Or at least, you know, even if it's a fear from having watched Jurassic Park or, you know, something, and the science doesn't interest you, there's something compelling about it. And I see it happen in museums, you know, I, I, 
I've worked in the travel and tourism industry for uh, like 14 years now. This is obviously the first time I've been working in any of it related to paleontology um, because this company, nobody was doing this before me. But, you know, so I've had the opportunity, incredible opportunity and privilege over my career to travel a lot, experience a lot of different types of travel, uh, visit museums around the world for various things, be, you know, arts, culture, history, whatever. And one thing I'll notice is like, Everyone knows what the Mona Lisa is, obviously. And you and you go to the yeah. Louvre and you have to see the Mona Lisa. And you go to the Mona Lisa and, and you know, I'm not here to throw shade at, at, at Da Vinci. Um, but, like, it's, I think most people are, have, have seen it so many times and it's smaller than you generally expect. Oh, and yeah, so it's, yeah. and it's, and the line of people to see it and the crowd and the cell phones in the air is all wild. Um and it can be a little bit underwhelming of an experience where it doesn't quite deliver what you were hoping for. Meanwhile, you know, I'm at the Chicago Field Museum uh, or I'm, I'm at the Berlin Museum of Natural History and we're looking up at the Brachiosaurus or Sue the T-Rex in Chicago. And so people who, who wandered in not even knowing that Sue the T-Rex was there necessarily or, you know, we're headed into the, to the Berlin Museum with the interest of ah, – it's a family day. We're going to go see the natural history museum. We'll take a look at, you know, all the, all the animals across the history that they have kind of stuffed or mounted there. Um, but you see what wins, you see what, you know, maybe, maybe the 12 year old in the family is the one who dragged them in to, to look up at the Brachiosaurus. Uh, and then the rest of the family is like, Whoa, there's, the, you know, like, it's overwhelming. It's, it shocks you. It's incredible. And everybody gets excited and suddenly everyone's reading and asking questions and, and, you know, you just, you, I enjoy an art museum. I really do. I, I, you can walk around and take a lot out of it and be moved, but you don't see people go, oh my God, the way that you do with dinosaurs. And it, it's interesting to me that it's almost perceived in the reverse. Like there's something prestigious about going to, of course, there's something prestigious about going to the Louvre. It's one of the most incredible museums I mean, on earth. Yeah, I mean, but, and everyone wants to do that. Um, and you should, but. You know, sometimes it's like, well, kids like dinosaurs. That's that's. But when you bring adults into that space and you put the rest of the context around everything, it still unlocks the imagination. It boggles the mind at times for every, people of every age, whether they thought they were interested in, in paleontology and dinosaurs or not. One of my favorite things is always whenever I get something from fossil crates. Uh, guess I'm not pulling that out. One of the most recent things was the uh, woolly rhinoceros skull. And I oh mean, yeah. I was showing it to my parents. I'm like, oh, look at what I got. And they're like, oh, that's cool. And as soon as I got it, they were like, can I have that? <laughs> let me, like, let me take a look at that. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, <laughs> but it's like, it, cause or you just say the word dinosaur. And I feel like definitely it has been in the spotlight long enough to where it has, I don't want to say it's died down, but it's, it's definitely a household name. So it's just something that comes up. Yeah. And then just, like once in a household, just, at some time it comes up everybody's like oh dinosaurs you see brachiosaurus you got t-rex you got things like that but actually going to see them completely changes your view on it it does yeah and that that is like a special moment because i remember whenever we were in colorado i don't know why i forgot that it was one of my most memorable trips <laughs> i mean we went to the uh colorado natural history museum and i mean because you, you go into it and you're like, ah, oh, we're going to see dinosaurs and all that. And you're like, the first thing you see when you walk in there is the massive Tyrannosaurus skeleton. And it's just like instantly kicks in. You're like, oh, God, that thing is massive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're just like, that is a lot different than I thought. Because I've been seeing all this stuff before that about like Sue the T-Rex, how they made like the model of her, like the yeah. model with all that. And I'm like, that thing looks tiny. And all these pictures I see, they look so tiny. And you always so get you, like, you, you got to encounter them in real life to really get the yeah, understanding I mean, of it. Like Brachiosaurus, every time I see it, I'm like, oh, well, it looks bigger than Allosaurus and Stegosaurus. But I mean, like this thing, I'm like, hold it in my hands. Uh, but like the day I actually see like the Brachiosaurus skeleton, I, I know I'm going to be like, that thing is 10 times larger than I was even imagining it. It is. It really is. I mean, I'm excited to have that experience you had in Colorado. We're headed out there for the for the second trip that we're doing. Uh, so we'll be hitting the museum. I'm excited to have that experience and, and have had that experience in, in Berlin, in particular, being in the same room with the Brachiosaurus, just literally taking up the whole room, you know, the tails dipping out the door one way. <laughs> and And I spent, you know, you see it. 
that's the other thing. You, and I know this isn't the case for everybody. Some people can spend hours looking at a painting and I can appreciate that for sure. But I, for me, I spent, you know, you see it. Okay. Maybe I could have moved on, but instead I, I don't know how long I spent in that room, just walking around it, getting appreciation for the different angles, standing beside it to be like, and, and you start to imagine it existing oh. on it. You know, this, this was a creature in the world that was out there. It's like it, 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 all we've got to even possibly even slightly compare it to, to is you have to go out whale watching and a humpback whale has to breach and you have to see the whole thing come out of the water to, to really kind of even get something comparable in our modern world to what that would be like to experience that, to see that. And, and, you know, it's, it's not all size, but, but size definitely makes it something impressive. And I think, you know, size is what, why every five-year-old loves dinosaurs because it unlocks something in the imagination of, of, these incredible creatures and you know and the more you get into it the more the small dinosaurs and all that can be appealing um and you start to appreciate the full spectrum of the thing but yeah i mean it, when we're starting out size size sometimes matters for for just how overwhelming these in a, in a very literal sense these things can be like not not throwing shade at smaller dinosaurs like <laughs> tom Signathus and the uh like velociraptor and Tiny ones like that, even even Ceratosaurus. I don't want to throw shade at Ceratosaurus. I love Ceratosaurus, but I mean, I feel like what people get drawn to in dinosaurs is definitely the size. Yeah, you see T Rex and that thing is massive, and you're like, that thing was ruling the world. You see Brachiosaurus and you're like, that thing is three times larger than that. How was that thing not the top dog in its ecosystem? And I mean. You say like Brachiosaurus and it's massive and there's things bigger than it. There's things taller, there's things longer, there's things that weigh more than it. And that's just like flabbergasting. I know. That's what with Patagonia, I'm so excited. We're going to get down there for the Titanosaurus. Like, oh my God. You know, when you, when you stand next to a femur and you go up to halfway, um, it, that, that really starts to unlock some things for you. <laughs> I feel like sauropods are one thing, but there's like Titan. Yeah, like sauropods and it's like Titanosaurus. Oh, yeah. You get to the next level. And I mean, like, it, it's just, and I personally got to experience this, but like, I feel bad for some of the people who have very abstract favorite dinosaurs. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but like, you, you find like one fossil and it's like in yeah. one minuscule museum halfway across the world. And you're like, I may never actually get to see that. And that's yeah, like exactly. a sad thing. But, I lucked out. My favorite dinosaur has been Allosaurus for like the longest time. And I like on that Colorado trip, we went to Utah, we went to Dinosaur National Park, and seeing like the actual Allosaurus like skeleton is just like you're like that. I like that. Can I have it? <laughs> Let me bring it <laughs> home with me. I mean, I forgot to take it out, but I got like an Allosaurus um like hand claw. And I mean and I, I was younger. It was God, five years ago now. <laughs> Time is sticking together. But, like, I mean, I still, like, remember that. Like, it was yesterday. I mean, in that wall of just all the fossils, like, Camarasaurus mixed in with Allosaurus and on top of Stegosaurus, and you just got, like, random bits everywhere. You're like, what happened? You can't help but ask, what happened? How did this happen? What was going on? Like, I mean, it's just, I, to the people that just go look at that and go, okay, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> there, I mean, and it's not a huge percentage of people who do that. That's the fun part no. of it. You know, it, it's, it's really hard to shrug off um, the excitement and, and the imagination around all of this, I think, which is, which is what makes it so intriguing. I mean, what, what makes it so inviting um, in its own right is, is, it's just that fact that like it, it's hard not to be captivated by by these things, really. And I mean, I, I've heard people that go, "Aren't dinosaurs childish?" And I'm like, "Yes, that's the point. <laughs> it's it's fun because it's like that. It 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 gives you that like experiment experience again, and you're like, yeah. these things are just almost like borderline fantasy creatures. Exactly." And I think that's why kids, you know, that's part of the reason that kids love them, as you said. Um, but with dinosaurs, you know, I, I I feel on two sides of this sometimes because one thing I'm trying to communicate with people is 
dinosaurs are not just for kids. You know, we, we, these these trips that we're doing, some of them, you know, you got to be 12 years old and up to come on. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, communicate to people what, what like I did with the example of the museum, you know, why there's, why this is interesting, why this is compelling. Um, the opportunity to discover something, you know, everybody talk, I've been in this industry for a long time and discovery is probably the most overused word in travel. But, you know, when you're searching out dinosaurs, there is a chance for true discovery, something that even if it's a, a species that we know a lot about, um, if you're uncovering a, a fossil, a, a bone in one of these animals, you still are the first human who's ever seen it. You're the first anything who's who's come in contact with this in, you know, at least 66 million years on, on the low end of things. That's really exciting. But the other part of it is like, it is a little childish in that, you know, the fun. lean back into, remember, remember what that excitement was as a kid. Remember what it's like to fire up your imagination, like, this for a, a lot of people who travel with us it is a childhood dream come true myself included like going out and actually getting to do a dinosaur dig last summer was something i'd wanted to do since i was probably three years old and learned that these you know we had to dig up these bones um and we actually got to do it we got to go and I mean, dig up dinosaur bones you know and and part of me was there that day as an adult and the person running a business being like this is really cool from a perspective of me as a 38 year old out here um doing this thing and and contributing to science or at least helping along for a day uh with science but then there's the part that's like man four-year-old five-year-old me would just be like are you serious we're doing this yeah, like and, so and you know what part was more rewarding the second part it was like i can't believe we're doing this we're finding dinosaur bones i'm looking at a true t-rex head i'm looking at an albertosaurus you know, and constructed. I'm talking with Dr. Curry, who is a legend and inspired Dr. Grant in Jurassic Park to some degree. Like it, the childhood, unlocking the childhood fantasy part is certainly an appeal. I'm not going to deny that. But there is a, a very, you know, adult and mature and scientific part that, that you can bring to the table too. It's got both sides of the coin very nicely. And it's one of the reasons why I personally am into it. I mean, I could sit here and probably yap about Tyrannosaurus for however long, but everybody's heard about Tyrannosaurus. And sure. there's so much more than just like T-Rex, Triceratops, even I hate to say it, Allosaurus, Brachiosaurus, and Stegosaurus. I mean, there's a lot more than that. And I mean, and I want to share those. I want to yeah. talk about those obscure dinosaurs. And it's like a special part, like, like, as, like, I remember, like, doing, like, a, a hydrosaur month, and I was, like, towards the end, I'm, like, this thing was so bland. But I was also just, like, then, I, then I'd, like, do some, like, just, like, looking at it at face value, I'm, like, this thing looks like the most basic dinosaur you could look at. And then I'm, like, one of it's like, oh, yeah, no, this thing's, like, the size of a T-Rex. And I'm, like, what? what? <laughs> I'm, like, I thought this thing was tiny. I thought this was just, like, something that was just getting smacked around by larger theropods. Right. It's, like, no. That thing could have like bench press T Rex minimal effort. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and I feel like every dinosaur has that unique thing. Like, like sauropods are famous for being the giants. I mean, and that's their thing. I mean, but it's just like every single one is so unique and has like some unique thing to it that just makes it so special. Yeah, and, and you know, that. as you're unlocking more of these or learning more, um, like with with any wildlife that we have today, it's many of them were, you know, by definition, ev evolution has has shaped them to be specialists in, in incredible things. Like with most species, they they survived for any amount of time by evolving into some speciality, some expertise, something very compelling that says something about themselves and says something about their environment and, and says something about evolution in its own in its own regard of like yeah. how amazing it is that like look at this little corner, look at this little niche that this creature of any size managed to occupy in order to exist and survive and look at the ways evolution shaped it. It's 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 fantastic to think about. And I mean like let's just take ankylosaurus for an example. Try to explain Ankylosaurus to somebody without using the word dinosaur or the actual name of it. Right. It's like, they're just, imagine they don't know anything about dinosaurs at all. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? 
<laughs> what is going on? Are you okay? Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, that's something like really fun about it because it's like it's kind of they're fun to explain. They're fun to talk about. And, I mean, it, that's I, just something that's special about them. Having watched, you know, be a prehistoric planet or life on our planet or any of the kind of programs that have come along with with people who aren't as into this as me, but you know, are, are interested to watch. It's fun to see them have that kind of reaction to something like an ankylosaur where it's like, wait, what? It did this and it's got a club tail and they like, yeah, no, this, or I think there's something that maybe there was some pushback from, from the people who just want to see Jurassic Park slash Jurassic World dinosaurs, you know, fighting or doing the, the sort of yeah. battles to the death. But there's, there's a lot of people who are, find it almost more interesting and compelling to see the ways we now think about them as presented, particularly I think in prehistoric planet quite well, which is like as creatures, as parents, as animals just trying to survive, as animals licking salt or whatever it is that it, that they got to do. There's something that I think a lot of people haven't, have only ever really been faced with dinosaurs from the pop culture perspective as these creatures of either destruction or something to be feared. And yeah, if you were out there, 150 million years ago be afraid be very afraid because they're it's it would have been terrifying let's say be, don't be afraid but yeah exactly if somehow you find yourself in that scenario you should be on, on the lookout but they weren't you know it's not just that it's it, much like with our modern wildlife it's not just you know the lion chasing down the gazelle and taking it to the ground there's so much other stuff going on and 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 we're learning about that all the time and, it, and it's compelling and interesting to think about in the ways of how did they how did these animals you know live and die and eat and mate and everything else that goes with it besides just the, the ferocity of them or the sheer size of them which is obviously the most exciting part and that's what opens the door but there's so much more once you walk through that door about just you know the this planet in a general sense over the hundreds of millions of years and the incredible uh, into many ways unimaginable creatures that have existed across the spectrum of time it's really something and i mean the one thing that's really special about paleontology to me is that it's it's not difficult to start no that's really good point that's a really good point if you want to get into it tomorrow just start researching one of the most famous dinosaurs, T-Rex or Triceratops. I mean, that's paleontology at, at like the peak, basically. I mean, yeah, you start on Wikipedia. Are, like, those are like the species you're most, interested in, go. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's pretty much how I start. I mean, book bags over here. Hang on. Like the way I started was, I personally do not remember every single species of dinosaur but i wouldn't imagine th there's way too many to just like memorize but i just started with like writing a journal that about every species and i got not just dinosaurs but mammals and as i go along i update it these are some less updated pages i need to go back and <laughs> see a giant gap at the bottom as i go like later on i mean that's too far um i like hear it fills up the whole page <laughs> I need to go back and do some of the sauropods. But, I mean, I still find new things about these creatures. I mean, there's so many of them, and they're so unique and so special, each one of them. I mean, and that's what's fun about them. And, and you can just specialize in one of them. That's something oh, that's, you can do. That's crazy. I mean, we do, for, for the website, you know um, – do a Q&A with paleontologists and people working in, in dinosaur research and science education um, to get a sense of, you know, for a lot of people who come to dinosaur trips or are either have kids who want to be paleontologists or are interested in going down that field themselves. And so we, we want to offer a little bit of information too about how each person became a paleontologist or got to work in dinosaur research. Um, and the one thing I've learned as I started doing all of these is every single person's got a very unique journey to how they came to it, um, certainly. But the other thing that, I, that I've come to learn is, you know, the, the specialty uh, that some people put into, not even if it's not even a specific species, a specific bone um, is really incredible. And, you know, for, and I mean, that's for the scientist. Um, <laughs> if you want to go that deep and, and that obsessive on one thing, it offers that to you. Or like you said, if you, if you just want to be dipping in from the, from a higher level of the, 
seemingly unimaginable number of species that exist and that you can find out a little bit or a lot about in different ways. It, there, there's just a there's mountains sitting there for you, no matter how you want to get into it. If you want to be, yeah, give me the surface level. The surface level is very rich. There's a lot going on there alone. And then, you know, actually, I'm somebody who wants to go so deep that I'm studying one part of one dinosaur to see what sounds they might have made. You know, that's that's available for you, too. It really, really any level that you want to dig down uh, part of the pond into, it, it's sitting there for you. I mean, one of my favorite websites, I mean prehistoric wildlife just i mean just a to z you just click on a letter let's go with k why not and you just scroll down and it's every just single creature that i'm pretty sure has been like found with that letter so let's go this one it, it i mean it gives you like a brief summary of it you usually use a paper. let's go brachiosaurus since we keep bringing up brachiosaurus sure it gives you like a usually a diagram of it uh head down i mean it gives you like little like things like how to pronounce it the name what it means the classification what like its diet kind, kind of it just says herbivore where it was found <laughs> which is even better i mean even like down to the time period and then as you scroll down there's other things where they like they source their stuff too Wow, there are a lot of sources wow. from Brachiosaurus. But I mean, it talks just like just a little bit about Brachiosaurus, and that's actually what I've been using at, for just wow from <laughs> from StreamYard. It just looks like blur. It's funny. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you guys, if any of you listening are interested, that is one of the many sources that I just go to. Yeah, it, it is reliable. I mean, they got like four or five different people working on it. Although I don't think it's been updated in a while. So if y'all listen, update your website, hopefully. <laughs> but I mean, if you just want to just do like a quick summary of, like I said, Brachiosaurus, just a quick thing. Just, I mean, go to prehistoric wildlife or just like you said, Wikipedia, just Brachiosaurus, Wikipedia, usually the first thing that pops up and just read. I mean, but anybody can do that if you really want if you're really into the dinosaurs figure out where to go figure out which museums have it figure out people who discovered it like uh ah, i forgot his first name but riggs he discovered um the brachiosaurus i mean uh just just like research him too i mean from him you can find other species that he discovered and i mean you could probably figure out where he was located just based on the species he mainly discovered. Oh yeah. Well, I think he was more on the famous end. So he traveled a lot more. So it's a little difficult, but I mean, that's just something that's like, there's a lot to just from like the name Brachiosaurus, just putting that into the search bar. There is so much that you can go into. Yeah. And, and we, you know, you talk about brings there and, and you, I know you alluded to the, to the bone wars earlier with Martian Cope and, and we, you know, we've been talking about how compelling and interesting and, and everything that paleo, like literal paleontology can be, the actual fossils and bones that you find. But there's another component, and, and you know, I've really been excited about this part of it is the history of paleontology, the history of paleontologists. They're yeah. very interesting, too. These people, you know, um, especially in like the in during the Bone Wars. <laughs> Like it was violent. It was lawless. It was a true wild west. I mean, that alone is super interesting to learn about. Some of these wild west eccentric, dinosaurs. yeah, some of these eccentric individuals who are going out there um, in ways that I, you know, we wouldn't necessarily see it as as the moral approach today. Um, but it's still, you know, it's a wild west history that's really fun. Mary Anning. It's really fun to learn about, you know what she was up to and her as an individual, as a person, there's, that's a part of it. We haven't even got into as we, as we're talking excitedly about all this is like paleontologists themselves. Some of them, yeah. Are stodgy <laughs> academics sitting in a research lab who might not have the best people skills, but there are plenty across time who have been some of the most interesting people you'll ever meet. Um, you know, burning down family fortunes, going to war with one another, getting, 
you know, armed gunmen out into the Wild West to protect, <laughs> stealing from one another in all these corrupt ways. It, that, you know, the human history of paleontology is something that's really fun to, to explore as well. Not throwing shade at uh, Clayton, the dinosaur cowboy, but they were some real dinosaur cowboys. They were doing some other things. And I mean, even just like as a science, the history of the science paleontology, I did like a whole episode on it. And I'm just like scratching the surface of it. I mean, I did the historiography of paleontology, which is just the history of history of paleontology. But I mean, yeah. I barely even scratched the surface on things. I could have probably kept going, but I ran out of paper. I did two pages of it and I'm like, this is probably going to be a longer episode. That was back whenever like 30 minutes was long for me, but no, no, I'm doing that per episode. So I probably got to go back and do an updated thing on that. Um, for but, sure. No, it's super I, so Like I was doing, the, I was doing something similar to you because we're, we're putting for 2025, some trips together specifically, you know, um, following the paleontology pioneers, specifically going to the places that, that Martian cope went to, um, and, you know, as I'm doing my research there and having fun with it, it's like, I guess we'll have to do this annually and just keep going to new places. There's so much to, to kind of tackle in all that they did, you know, and, and not just Martian Cope, but, you know, the, the whole kind of history of Wild West and the, and the Golden Age or the, the Bone Wars Age uh, in, in the Gilded Age that that is fun to explore. There's There's um, a lot to it. I mean... Yeah, or, 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 you know, Barnum Brown, who discovered the T-Rex and yeah. his whole story and everything that's attached to that. And then you get into their own personal politics and how they bounced off one, one another and some felt they were using T-Rex for, you know, horrible purposes to support Nazi propaganda. You just, it started, you're like, oh my God, there's so much stuff that it can be tied to this and has at times been taken by certain factions for positive or negative things in the world. It's... It, when you start down the road, as you said, you started, you're like, ah, I'm out of pages already. And I feel that sometimes when we're starting to build out these trips, it's like, okay, so this will take 10 years of trips to even start to, to just trace these two guys history, you know? Because I mean, even like I, I did it on like major parts of it, of like paleontology. So I kind of specified and really, really, really dumbed down because <laughs> version but i mean two of the major people that i talked about is the uh uh what was his name john phillips uh where's the other one uh, i talked william smith i think no that's his uncle i think he slapped chris rock martin will will uh willstrid i think his name is but i mean I'll find it later and I I don't want to spend five minutes looking for it and have like an odd section of five minutes of silence. But I mean, like one of them is just like the father of paleontology. He kind of created the idea of paleontology. I mean, of course there were things before it. People found bones sure. and they had ideas and even the Greeks, they found like petrified wood and shells and things that they collected. Yeah. But he was really the first official person to start like, trying to put it together and then the other guy john phillips was the one that broke down the geological time scales kind of started to break that down and i mean just like that i mean that in general it has its own like portion and there's a stuff on top of that and i mean that's just crazy to think about like i mean i can only like imagine some of the things that like some of the ancient people who found these things like like the um on here uh the persians there's a guy that wrote a book in persia um fossils discovery by persian naturalist ibn sina i'm probably butchering his name but uh he wrote the book of healing and he talked about how like they were finding these large bones and they thought that they was just like belong to giants. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, and that's still like a joke on like Instagram and TikTok that I see occasionally. They're Me like, too. Oh, look at this thing. It's a, it, the government's hiding giants from you. And you're like, no, it's just a dinosaur. 
Well, why would we hide di- why would we hide giants if they existed and make up this whole other thing? I don't understand. We, we, had we won't go down that road, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's, we had them. We called them dinosaurs. Exactly. And I mean, I, I understand thinking when you first found one, these must have been from giants. They were kind of right. They just weren't human giants. Yeah, I mean, they were different kind of giants. And the uh, ancient Chinese considered them dragons, and and I like I I keep seeing this joke where people are like. Dragons must have existed. We keep we find tales of them everywhere. I'm like dinosaurs. <laughs> exactly. They're found everywhere. Literally um, everywhere. Like the Prince Creek formation all the way down to Antarctica. I mean, there's stuff everywhere. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I, like well, that's why I mean with everything we're talking about, I can't believe no one's done a company like mine before. I mean, there's just so much to tap into, so much to explore. And as you just said, like from the far north to the deep to the far south you're going to find some there's opportunities for this everywhere that you go um and every facet of it whether it's what we were just talking about with the paleontology the individuals as humans the science of it the awe of it it's just like all of this is is really impressive really compelling to think about really interesting it unlocks the imagination um why are we doing this more <laughs> yeah i mean like I was doing the unboxing for the uh Kilodontin Kilodonta skull. I'm probably butchering that. I don't have the pronunciation, but I was just like I just put a little portion there. Where I was just like, you know, it'd be really cool for some scaled skull ideas. And I just got carried away. And like I you could just keep thinking of stuff forever and ever and ever. Cause I was just like, ah, oh, what about Carnotaurus, Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, which he's doing. He already confirmed that to me because I'm gonna buy one. It's my favorite dinosaur, but I mean, and you could just keep going because I was just thinking of carnivores. So like things like Crylophosaurus, they got like the weird crest, but then that made me think of like herbivores, like Parasaurolophus, Edmontosaurus, like Lambiosaurus, Shanatungosaurus. And then you got like smaller ones, like all the Ceratopsians, because he's got Taurosaurus and Triceratops. What about Styracosaurus and Chasmosaurus and Camarasaurus? And well, that's a sauropod, but. I mean, even that. I mean, I don't think he has any sauropod ones. Maybe he does. I don't know. But, like, there are so many unique dinosaurs with so many, like, unique attributes. And it's just so fun to look at. Like, and it's so – well, like I said earlier, I dare you to try to uh, explain Ankylosaurus to somebody without using the word dinosaur or Ankylosaurus. I mean – they're going to think you're crazy, and it's a little bit entertaining. I mean, I, that's the fun of it. I mean, there are so many unique species, and to think that we are nowhere near discovering all of them. No, we're scratching the surface. I mean, you know, you're talking about a favorite dinosaur. It's like some of the most interesting ones still could be very undiscovered. You know, they, we, they still could be waiting for us to unlock something where we're, that our minds are just blown at the prospect of it. Because, like, it, and it, even for me, I I say Allosaurus is my favorite, and it is because it's the one that I've just been exposed to the longest sure. because of the Ballad of Big Al. At the, uh, I just remember watching that as a kid, and just, like, my parents saw that. I was so obsessed with it that they got me a little Allosaurus thing from it, and I'm like... Oh, whoa, cool. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, I still do. I just call it Big Al. I just refer to it as Big Al. I mean, and I'm still discovering new things about Allosaurus. But if you were to ask me my second favorite dinosaur, I'm like, this one. Wait, what about this one? What about Brachiosaurus? What about Suchiomimus? What about Therizinosaurus? I mean, there's so many just it, – it's hard to just like – just, just go that one. I yeah. only want to do that one. And for the people who do that, I envy you because you have a very decisive mind. I mean, and I think, I think, like I said earlier, I mean, what's so special is that you can start whenever. Because oh yeah, I, you can get into it at any point. I mean, it's there's 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 not really a barrier to entry. Yes, these things are held up, you know, somewhat behind institutions and, and getting into paleontology. Um, you know, to be a proper paleontologist and get your PhD and all that. It's, 
it's a lot it's like fun. like any any doctorate and that makes sense as a doctorate it should be it should be challenging and, and demand a lot of you but you don't need to do that to get into yeah, paleontology yeah. you just you don't even need to get close to doing that you need to pick up a couple books if you want um and, like, and most of the ones that you're going to find at your your normal bookstore are are not textbooks for paleontology classes these are books that have been written so that the layman like myself can understand what we're talking about and start to give you some context and framing around these things you don't like with um with with my newsletter that goes out you know i always put a little part in in the bottom of it that's just like intro to dino 101 and it's describing the difference between a sauropod and a theropod you know and and what those things mean um and that's you don't need to even know that you don't need to know that to come on one of our trips um we'll give you know you'll acquire that information lightly that you don't you know you don't have to study anything um and and the same if you don't come on one of our trips like if, if you just find this compelling or interesting in some way then there it's really accessible especially you know and i think that's what helped me get back into it was once you know the internet really took off in, in a lot of ways specifically social media and these things weren't kind of hidden away in, in little corners of the internet or, or in libraries that were hard to find exactly oh, what you're looking for that's, that's yeah cute. exactly yeah it's or even knowing which museums to go to i mean you know as i put together these trips uh, it helps to have our paleontology partners and experts you know pointing me in the right direction of course but even without them you know just just the fact that i can go online and find out what what a collection holds and find out what kind of access we can get and but, you can you can you know i don't want you to build these dinosaur trips yourself much easier to just come and join us but you can do it for yourself it is all accessible i mean um to, no, to no just kind of start true. No offense like human history. My brother's really into human history. But, I mean, if if you're promising dinosaurs on a trip, you probably don't want to end up taking people to, like, a Civil War museum. They're going to be like, what's going on here? Are you telling me there are dinosaurs in the Civil War? What are you telling us? There I might mean, be some people who would claim that, by the way. But <laughs> Probably. I mean, that's actually, like, one of the reasons that, like, America started going out west is because they heard something about dinosaurs out here, and they're like – want to go look at that thing <laughs> it's like but i mean like i was in alaska and i was just like there's nothing up here it's too cold what would be up here other than maybe some like mammals coming across the land bridge course, whatever that yeah. was maybe that but i was at like the southern one of the most southern parts anchorage i mean it's pretty far south for alaska i mean yeah. and i was like oh, there's got to be nothing here i mean I, I i hate to just like go somewhere and be like yeah, there's nothing. I'm not even going to try to look for anything. I always, every time we go somewhere, I'm like, I want to look for stuff, see if there's a natural history museum of some sort, because that's just what I'm into. I found a whole collection that just somebody had like a warehouse of just like, it was just their personal collection and they just had it lit like all over the walls. They had like tables set up with things. They had like, there's like a field trip or something going on there. And there's a bunch of like little kids looking at dinosaur bones that the lady had laid out on the floor on just like a rag. I mean, and like just like on the ceiling, she had like a giant Quetzalcoatl just hanging off the ceiling. That way, I'm like, this is amazing. And I'm like, if the internet didn't exist, I wouldn't know about this. This would, this is not something that would like just get like the proper attention. Yeah. And it, I mean, there's just so much there. I mean, it's so hard to just visit all of it, but it's something that you like feel like you have to do. It's something that you want to do. I mean, you're talking about like the PhDs. That's not even something you have to do. That's not at all. That's if like you want to be like the dinosaur guy. Exactly. You can be the dinosaur guy, but if you want to be the dinosaur guy, you go and get your PhD. That's not even like, I'm not even in college yet. I haven't even like, properly started i don't even want to say that because i have i've like built connections i've talked to people i've researched these animals i do a podcast on them that's exactly and that's before i'm even like going to school to specialize in that i mean my plan is i'm just going to major in geology i mean you get rocks you get dinosaurs you get human history you get anthropology archaeology you get all of it in that just broad yeah, I mean, subject you know and what i mean a lot of the paleontologists I've talked to in, you know, building this company out, that's what, that's a, where they started in, or that was the first kind of thing that they were interested in, or, or the class that captured their imagination was geology, you know? I mean, because 
I, I love dinosaurs. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want to just cut everything out of it, everything else out of it. I, I want to know the rocks around the dinosaurs, why they fossilize, things like that. Maybe, like, later on, whenever there were mammals over them, what mammals were over the dinosaurs that were walking over the, like, these parts of the dinosaurs. Maybe the humans that hunted those mammals. Maybe the people that even discovered these dinosaurs mm -hmm. and had them as, like, cultural parts of their things. This, we were talking about dragons earlier. I give you nine times out of ten – it was a dinosaur. One time out of ten, I feel like it was somebody crazy, and they were just like, <laughs> "I saw something flying." It's like, because mm. I, I I feel like may, maybe some people were seeing some stuff that wasn't actually there because we didn't they didn't have the medical science that we like we do now, and there's definitely something to that. And, but I mean, if I found like an Allosaurus or T Rex or any large theropod dinosaur, and I was like. I don't know what a dinosaur is. Yeah, I'm not there's no concept make, of this creature. Yeah. I'm not going to make the connection that, oh, it's an Albertosaurus skull. I'm going to be like, I, what is this thing? What is? What going do I on? have culturally to contextualize it? Um, you know, what? And dragons seem to be what many cultures came up with, which is interesting in and in a conversation probably all of its own. But you can uh, even like look at each culture and see like the difference between the, the dragons. And that even is like part of it. Like, yeah. Like I feel like the like classic Chinese long dragon was probably something to do with sauropods. They got yeah. the long neck, the long tail. And then they found some kind of carnivore nearby. And they're like, maybe this but, like teeth that are this big. <laughs> yeah. But you have like more Western dragons where you find things like, like in Britain, where you have like Baryonyx and Ceratosaurus, so you get that more four-legged, big wings, big creature kind of I like Western ideal of a dragon. But I mean, I, I mean, it's like just amazing to look at, and there's like a human aspect to it too. That I mean, e even if for some reason I doubt it's going to happen, I get tired of dinosaurs and I start to go out more on the humans. I don't want to like just cut it off by specializing in paleontology. So it's like, I mean, uh, if I'm like, cause I mean, one, like you might find like out West, you find a lot of dinosaurs, but there were also like things like native Americans there. So you might be finding something you're like, Oh, it's a dinosaur bone. And it turns out to be a human bone. You got that archeology span aspect to it. Now you get like, <laughs> one of my favorite things, I was looking up like different types of paleontology. They're like, oh yeah, we have our own archaeology. It's paleoarchaeology. And I'm like, creative name. <laughs> it's like, yeah, sure. But I mean, there's that aspect of it too. And I mean, <laughs> like anthropology, I, <laughs> I remember I was having a conversation with somebody about anthropology. And I, I was stuck in like the paleontologist mindset where I'm like, yeah, this thing's like 65 million years old, give or take all of human existence. And they're like, oh, yeah, the Egyptians were so long ago. Uh, they were like this many thousands of years old. And I'm like, that's not old. What do you mean? They're like, what do you mean? That is really old. And I'm like, I look at dinosaurs most of the time. That's not old to me. <laughs> I mean, that's also like a fun part. When, I, Like, I feel like when your creature goes, yeah. This the mold of this dromaeosaurus bottom jaw is 66 million years old, and then you they're like give or take all of human existence. Give or, yeah, the, the the rounding error in in paleontology is more than even the furthest away ancestors of humans have existed. You know, it's it's wild to think about. Like, it's literally like give or take all of human existence yeah and that should be the slogan for paleontology <laughs> that's good i like that a lot that's good. <laughs> that should be the slogan it's give or take all of human existence because i mean it's hard to like i mean i turn to like what's the first one i open uh dialogue i mean uh it was in the cretaceous like 129.4 ish to 125 million years ago give or take i mean that's like a wide amount of years i mean i always because it's hard to specify it's like t-rex was exactly 65 million years ago 
Yeah. But it's like, it wasn't. It was. It not. existed <laughs> for a long period of time. It existed for longer than humans. Oh, yeah, by a long shot. On top of the fact that, like, T Rex is closer to humans than, like, some other dinosaurs, like, I don't want to say sauropods, but like Brachiosaurus and like Stegosaurus and Allosaurus. But it's like, so, well, that, that I love telling hmm. people that who, you know, are, are, are newer to this idea or thinking about paleontology and dinosaurs in, in that way is using that example you just did is one of my favorites. It's like, the, we're closer to T-Rex and T-Rex was to Stegosaurus is I think the example that, that is often cited and, and that blows people's mind. And, you know, yes, that's interesting about dinosaurs, but that's also interesting in well, thinking about the history of our planet, you know, and where we sit in that history. Like it's not just about contextualizing how long dinosaurs are around for it. It really helped. I always find that unlocks for people, you know, just this, how old the planet is, how much time has gone by, how little time we've occupied. I mean, I know that, you know, speaking to that archaeology piece and how much shorter that is, but like the example that people love to give in that is, is kind of the, the equivalent of the Stegosaurus to T-Rex ratio is like Cleopatra lived closer to our time than she did to when the pyramid, the pyramids were ancient when Cleopatra yeah. was ruling over Egypt. And, you know, that's, that's like this little piece. And then you talk about the Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus piece, and it becomes like, it's just, you start to contextualize these things or think about them in a way you have that doesn't just unlock paleontology. It, it changes your appreciation for our existence in one way or another and time and how little time we've occupied on this planet and the blip that we've created. And, and never, you know, it, it for me, that's really exciting. That, get, that gets me excited to think about where we sit and how long it's come to me and you having this conversation on a podcast, you know, um, about these you things really and, and everything up. that led to it. It's it's fun. It's fun. I find that, you know, it's it's one of the exciting things about existing and, and being able to contemplate existence. I mean, if you if you look at like like species, humans were basically here like that. Yeah, we're, we, we're just brand new. We came quick and we, like, just conquered everything, basically. I mean... Oh, we're an impressive species from a uh, from a taking over the world in very little amount of time. Like, we're a very impressive species. One of the most ma- incredible there's ever been. Yeah, it's, it's, I it's to say fun to think mean. about. Because, <laughs> like, dinosaurs, it took them, like, millions of years to start to actually evolve. But mammals, it took them, like, practically nothing to get... To fill in the niches. We're, fast little, we're, we're, we're good at occupying niches for sure. Because, I mean, like you have like, you had all these dinosaurs to do all the niches. Like, oh, this one fed on this fish in this river. And that's why it lived here. But this one hunted that one. And you have all these specific dinosaurs like, like that. But mammals didn't really have that millions of years to do that. We just were just like, all right, we're here now. Well, it's and, interesting. I mean, we think that. But then I, I've been reading something recently. I mean, that that's true for mammals, for sure. But it's like, oh, like, specifically, how did dinosaurs get so big? Um, it's like, well, maybe they were also very good at evolving. Like, evolution happens almost faster than we can imagine. Um, because it seems like it's so complex. And it is so complex. I mean, it, it takes in every factor of existence to, to make it happen. But it does seem to happen quickly and the more you know the more species of dinosaurs we discover the more post dinosaur species we discover you know you it it just changes our appreciation for even evolution of how fast it can go and how interesting it can work and and how something like humans can pop up all of a sudden and and be the dominant species on a planet and then unlock the history of the planet that they're on it's it's awesome and it is like i i'm sure it is like Every little boy and girl's dream to go find the T-Rex, like the big old rooted T-Rex tooth that's like fat sure. long. And, that, and that's not going to just happen for everybody. And that is something that is a little sad. But there's also stuff that you can still go find just around. Yeah. Like, for example, like I, since I live in like South Carolina, I don't get the big T-Rex and all that. So... I went to the beach to just go like shark tooth hunting and I found like, I mean, and I was like, Oh cool. It's a cool shark tooth. And I was talking to the Russian archeologist dude again. I mean, he was like, yeah, that tooth is like millions of years old and you just found it on a beach. He's like, he's like, yeah, that thing is the ancestor to a Megalodon. And I'm like, yeah. 
and I just found it on a beach. And I'm like, because like you think about that, and it's it sounds so weird because usually something like that sounds like it should it should be like really expensive, really hidden away from people. But you're like, no, I just walked on the beach and found it. I mean, there's been trillions. Of, I don't even know how the number. To, pronounce, to, to imagine the number, but like the amount of individual creatures that have existed in the history of this planet is, you know, it's not infinite, but it might as well be infinite. And so, yeah, it's there's still opportunities in everywhere, even if you don't think you live in, an, in a fossil rich area, to discover this long, long road that, that eventually led to, to us and, and where we are right now in this moment in the history of our planet. I mean, you may not live in a fossil rich as in big old dinosaurs, but there is always something. Yeah. Because, I mean, other than maybe like the tippy toppy top of the world, there might just like not be nothing because it's inaccessible. Sure. So we just said there's nothing. But we don't know till we go there. So I'm probably yeah. lying too. There, there might be billions of fossils up there that's still hidden that we just we're like that we haven't even got to yeah we can't get up there so we just I mean because I mean to think about like ancient mammals we have them preserved in like ice with like mm -hmm. fur skin like bone meat like all of it still on the body and that somebody ate a mammoth burger <laughs> that that is so funny. The dude was like, "Yeah, it just tastes like freezer, freeze, freezer dried or freezer burned uh, hamburger." <laughs> sounds right. <laughs> just hilarious. It's like, yeah, it sounds about right. I mean, but like, because you, can, I, I remember being a little kid. and You go on YouTube and you're like, "Are we cloning dinosaurs?" And you see all these YouTube videos about, oh, in twenty twenty four, we're gonna be cloning mammoths and things. But it's also like. You know, it's actually not an abstract idea. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, A, they weren't that long ago. B, humans existed during the same time. C, we still have them preserved. And, and I, I feel like we won't ever be able to properly clone a mammoth. But, like, I've seen, I've heard, like, the idea of, like, selective breeding. Yeah. We could selectively breed, like, African elephants back to being mammoths. I mean, it would just take that, like, unique time i mean and there's because sadly i doubt that we're ever going to get like a proper jurassic part kind of sadly i've seen sadly or maybe movies. for the best i was gonna say <laughs> yeah i've seen how those movies in it would be fun but <laughs> maybe not but i mean but like there's so much there that like you see them on the big screen like that and it just blows you away and i mean like you were talking about prehistoric planet and life on our planet and i'm like watch i watch those and i'm like yeah this dinosaur looks like this big this because you don't eh, eh. on jurassic park you have that comparison you're like yeah here's t-rex here's human you have that comparison t-rex is <laughs> sure. massive it's this massive beast but in those shows, it shows you how they were in the ecosystem, why they had to be that big, why why some dinosaurs were smaller. Like they, they crawl into the burrow and this one is smaller and it has this like longish neck, like Compsognathus and Coelophysis. And that like snake like – or like not snake, but uh, pointed like head because it would put its head in the burrows and pull out tiny mammals. And, and like uh, I think it was Rogosaurus or something – on i think it was prehistoric planet season two i want to say and I, I was looking at it and i'm like that thing looks tiny and i was doing some research and i'm like that thing is twice as big as me right I'm like, yeah, even the mid-ranges are pretty big so <laughs> I, i'm like and that's something that's just like so appealing about them is that when you see them together like if i were to put sukio mimus in Baryonyx together. They're probably roughly I think Baryonyx is bigger if I'm not mistaken. It's like ever so slightly bigger. Hmm. But if you toss a human in there, you're like, those things are massive. Or the opposite is true. Those things are small. Like Ceratosaurus. I brought up Ceratosaurus earlier. In mm -hmm. Jurassic Park 3, you see the Ceratosaurus and they look at him and it's like looking down at him. 
and like I, for the longest time, I'm like, Ceratosaurus is these giant hulking creatures. They're they must be massive. Then they must be bigger than people. They're about as tall as like the average adult man. I mean, right. they they're not actually that tall. But what gives them that wow factor is that they're they got they got the head that comes out the tail. It's so long. And they weigh so much. And I mean, that's the amazing part. And still like, be terrified to ever encounter. I mean, oh, I find that's what, like that was one of the conversations I was having with guests. <clears throat> Excuse me, was you know we're like, oh man, can you imagine running into you know we're an Alberta so an Albertosaurus, like how scary that would be. But I was like, you know, I'd be scared to run into obviously like in the wild a tiger. And a tiger's large cat, but it ain't, you know, most of these, or, or, or a huge number of these, like, theropods that we're finding are, like, they would have been about that size. I mean, I don't want to run into anything that's my size with a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth. <laughs> it doesn't need to be ten times bigger than me to be one of the most terrifying things that you could ever have encountered. I mean, in, like, this new study about, like, dinosaur vocalization... I love it. I did a whole episode on it. it and I mean, I was like discovering because I see all this stuff on like YouTube or not YouTube, um, uh, Instagram and things where they're like, oh, when I was younger, I thought T-Rex sounded like this. And then they play yeah. the um, Jurassic Park T-Rex audio. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's what we grew up with. You get that T-Rex audio. Which is weird because I'm pretty sure it was like a, a baby elephant that made like a really weird noise. That was, was that part. Like, I mean, they layered a bunch of sound on yeah, top they of each bunch, other. Like, but a, a elephant. baby elephant was is key to to that to that sound. They've got a live roar like, in there too, and a whole the, bunch of other things. And you get this very unique sound, and it's this bone chilling sound. And I mean, I went to the mountains earlier, and we we were watching Jurassic Park. These speakers could not handle the roar. <laughs> the TV speakers could not handle it. And it's it was just like crazy. And, and you grow up on that. And then you get this new study and it's like this weird bellow now. And you're like, that sounds a lot different than you think. Like Triceratops was like, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. That's what I would have thought. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, it's like it's like a cow. It's like a cow sounding thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, T-Rex was like the opposite. You're like, that is the exact opposite. But one thing, and I actually did a reel on it. Uh, I did a reel on it because I feel like it wasn't getting the proper love that it deserved. Was uh, Dilophosaurus? Because I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the Jurassic Park like Dilophosaurus chirping, but like the actual study that uh, that this that this person just released. So go subscribe to them and listen to it was like it is just different altogether I mean, like, that's like alien sound and stuff in, in our imaginations, you know, it sounded like an it's alien. terrifying. It's terrifying. It's not it's not any less scary than a roar. Uh, God, it's different, no, right? I think it's more it's terrifying. Really, it might be, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, imagine you're walking around the jungle uh, and you hear that sound in the bushes. Like that's I'm, I'm also the problem. I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think they found out that Dilophosaurus might have been uh, nocturnal, too. Right. So you wouldn't hear it in broad daylight and be able to turn around and see it. You'd hear it from like the shadows, and you're like, "I hear it's it everywhere." Like perfectly camouflaged, and you, you <laughs> have no like, chance I, to see I, it. I hear it everywhere. Where is it? <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, I mean, that like that that is just like, and I I that is actually one of the things that got me to like start at, like loving Dilophosaurus, like. I didn't hate it, but I, like I was like, 
And Dilophosaurus is rather interesting, but I mean, I was like listening to, I'm like, yeah, I see this uh, Jurassic Park Dilophosaurus, and it's like a tiny little thing. The frills were weird, but rather interesting. And I'm like, yeah, it sounded cool. But then I'm like, I hear that, and I'm like, that is bone chilling. Yeah. I, I would have a heart attack and just have to lay down and accept my fate if I heard that. <laughs> I mean, like, and because you think about it, you're like, wait, that actually makes sense because Dilophosaurus was one of the few dinosaurs that had a crest, so it probably sounded like you get the um like Parasaurolophus, it has a crest, so it has a very unique sound. Mm-hmm. And we like kind of always thought that it was vocal because of that crest. Because of the crest, yeah. But like you, you see Dilophosaurus and you're like, oh, it's got big teeth and it's the theropod, so it must have roared. But it's like, well, it also had a crest, so it was probably just as vocal. And it's just like you think you start to think about that and you start to do, like do that, and you're like, oh god, I just discovered one of the most frightening sounds. And I mean, I, you're bringing up how it's like alien in sound. I mean. I think an alien would sound would be terrified of that too. Yeah, I think there's something natural about being scared of that sound. It, it definitely suggests it's definitely <laughs> something that that is supposed to invoke fear. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I don't, I don't know if you saw this, but I don't even remember what it was. But it was a dude talking about it. I'm just bringing this up out of context, and he was like, "Yeah, if we saw like an alien that looked like a xenomorph, you would, you would be like, oh no, it's an alien shaped like a xenomorph." Uh, but you're also like that's kind of what I expect, right? But imagine if we found humans on a different planet. That would be the most messed up. You would be. You would not be like mentally. We've already like mentally accepted, thanks to like Hollywood, that aliens are going to be different from us. No, that would that but would shake everything. Finding like other like even like dinosaurs on a different planet, it would be like, wait, that's a T Rex on. <laughs> Yeah, Neptune. it would tell us so much about how life kind of evolves along maybe specific I mean, patterns, like, or how we came to be, or how you know this was in our this was in the recipe for life from from the drop. However, that whatever it is that created that recipe at some point along the way, it, and I mean, I suppose it seems unlikely, but it's there's there's the possibility of it too in, in the in the infinite amount of possibilities that there is for what's out there. Everybody always talks about like how frightening it would be to see this alien or that alien, but I'm like, I feel like the most frightening thing would be it just be like a species from Earth, just out there existing on another planet. You're like, exactly. I just, wait just, a minute, I was not ready for that. <laughs> like, if you <laughs> like you just go to a different planet and you basically just see like yourself, and you're like, something seems a little weird here. <laughs> like, I wasn't ready for you. I mean. I think that that would be the most horrifying because then you're like, oh, we're not alone and they're the exact same as us. <laughs> what does that say? What does that shake our like, understanding? Because, about... uh, I mean, I feel like in most places, like, because I always see, like, things like that on planets where people make fun of the al- – in movies where they make fun of the aliens and they're like, oh, well, it's just like a humanoid-like thing. But it's like, actually, that makes a lot of sense. It would just be bigger, smaller, maybe a different color, just just based on like the environment. But right. it being like humanoid would make sense too. I mean, evolution—it's—it's it's, it's what makes all of this so compelling. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and interesting. I guess is is just what got us here. Well, and I suppose on a grander sense, why are we here? But just, but how we got here? Why we got here? And, and what shaped everything that, that put us to this place today? And you know, what does that look like in another planet, in another condition, in another environment? It's uh, you know, it, it's fun to even you know what we're doing now is, is so what I find there. happens when we're, when we're t- when you start these conversations. It evolves, you know. Then you start thinking about things like aliens. And wait a second, what what does shape life the way it has been shaped? What causes you know, do, do humans, the one thing, as far as we know, that has ever existed on the face of our planet that has really been able to con- conceptualize existence in itself, you know, are we even here if an asteroid doesn't strike the Earth 66 million years ago? And, like, what does all that look like? It's Frankly, Once you start down this road, it, you, the extrapolations are, are endless. Because I was talking to uh, 
Ty- uh, I think it was Tyrannosaurus. I think it was him. And how he was talking about how towards the end of the Creatius, how creation Cretaceous, wow, <laughs> dinosaurs were kind of on like a decline that like way. Yeah. Unique evolution. But yeah. So I was talking about it, and he's like, even if the asteroid didn't hit Earth, could humans have that possibility? Mm-hmm. I personally think that no. I don't I think maybe not where we're at now. Right. Maybe like another billion years down the line we could have came into existence but it would have taken like four times as long easily and, and it I, I feel like reptile people would be more logical <laughs> fair enough yeah that makes a lot of sense everybody makes that joke but it's also not abstract no it's it, it, I, it seemed like it probably could have very much been in the cards at some point so like for eventually for evolution to find their way there yeah like everybody always talks about how Oh, this famous person is a reptile person. But it's also like, (laughs) wait, we had dinosaurs. And imagine it from like like a dinosaur perspective. Imagine them going, oh, we have monkey people pretending to be be dinosaurs. (laughs) Like, I mean, like, it sounds just as weird. I mean, but it's like, what is going on here? You start to like make some weird connections and you're like, Wait, are these conspiracy theorists right? What's going on here? Did, and oh my god, there was one museum, and it's it was a little TikTok thing for a while. They're, they're um talking about uh, it was like a time chart, and they had all the dinosaurs on it, and they put extinct. And somebody was like, "Oh, um, I find it funny that they had to specify that dinosaurs were extinct." And there was one, I think it was like Myoraptor or something, and it didn't have that. It didn't have extinct on it. He was like going over. He's like, it's funny how they had to specify that it was extinct. Yes, take it. Wait a minute. Like this one's not extinct. This one around. And then it's just like, <laughs> it's, just, it's like that's a bird now. That thing exactly. evolved into bird. And and that's what they figured out that that thing it didn't necessarily go extinct from the asteroid, the way, but it like yeah. turned it it went extinct due to evolution. And I think that is. That is something that def like there are definitely like um, event extinctions like the six major mass extinctions where you yeah. have asteroids you got flooding and glaciers and storms and death volcanoes covering the earth for most of human existence as a time I mean but there was definitely extinction due to evolution too oh because sure. the one of the most famous examples that I can think of is Smilodon. It did part of the reason it went extinct was because of that human sport hunting, which is actually something that I found really crazy about that. Is that that was one of those things that was like us humans sport hunted that. Get with it. <laughs> it's like it's, I don't it's like I don't want to go poke a tiger with a with a stick. No. But they really sure not. did. Just <laughs> but, a good thrill. <laughs> Like I can see why we invented the bow and arrow. <laughs> yeah, put some distance. I can, I can see why we invented that. <laughs> like, I'm not getting that close to go. Hey, tiger, poke. But I mean, also just the specialized hunting of the um giant fangs that I have. Like I mean, I've got some multi. I mean, they were specified for bigger, slower creatures, right? To like pierce the jugular. Right. To basically drown them in their own blood, which sounds really gruesome and really horrifying now that I say that out loud. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of it is out there. A lot of it is. It's a it's a survival. So a lot of it's gruesome and horrifying. It's very it's very like an, it's a very niche role. And then as species evolved to basically not be hunted by them, they got smaller, they got quicker, they could outrun, out stamina the smile on. They had to change too. They had to evolve. They had to change into maybe quicker like the cheetah for faster prey, but or maybe bigger and stronger like lions and tigers for that, like maybe the bigger prey that was still around. But Smilodon as a whole isn't relatively like – I'm sure the gene is just in a tiger somewhere. I mean, if you find a tiger and you analyze the gene, I'm pretty sure like one of those – I don't even remember what they call them, but I, I just call them the lock genes because it's 
what they are. They're the genes that are locked away through time. I mean, I'm sure if you unlock some of them, you just get like a saber tooth tiger. I mean, also like what big cat with big fangs is abstract to you. <laughs> I mean, plenty of those. Have that. Yeah, exactly. Kind of have that. I mean, there's plenty of them. It's not that around. crazy of an idea. I mean, no, not at all. But e- even for like sharks, sharks are around because things like Dunkleosteus. I keep saying Dunkleosaurus, but that's not the same thing. Dunkleosteus, the um, which is another like armor fish. Yeah. <laughs> What was evolution doing? <laughs> like it went extinct in extinction. And so sharks were able to explode and evolve and change. And so they were able to like show up. And that yeah. is something that was very unique and that I personally love to look at. And I mean, there's so much there. Oh, it's, you know, and we're missing it. Yeah. We're missing and we- a lot of it. No, it's for sure. I mean, it's it's endless discovery. It's it's, you know, there's there'll be no. I, I'd be very surprised if there was ever an end to the amount of dinosaurs we're discovering. You know that we hit every species that we could possibly find, or or I feel beyond like that. The day that we're like we have discovered every dinosaur, is the day that the sun's like dying. Well, yeah. I mean, there one, we'll never find them all because they didn't all fossilize, and two, we won't even find all the ones that fossilized. It's just, it's yeah. I mean, so deep. There's so much. Kind of impossible to do that. Yeah. And I mean, again, the the ones that fossilized. There's that preservation bias, like pterosaurs. Like I feel like sauropods. I I've personally never excavated dinosaurs, but I feel like like the large theropods and sauropods are easier to do that with. Just because their bones are so, I mean, deep, they're bigger. They're so <laughs> exactly, they fossilize easier. They they have less. They're so dense that it's like hard to break them if you accidentally hit it. But like, yeah. like a like a pterosaur, you're like, think. Oh, I tapped it the wrong way. Now it's gone forever. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like you just go at the slightest angle oh. at the wrong angle. It's gone. It's certainly something that when we're out there digging, you know, especially people on their first day of doing some excavation, it's like that keeps going through your mind as you, you know, as you've got the tools in there. It's like, I can't break this. I can't do it. And you like, it's just, you're so, careful. I don't want to break so this. I don't this, be is, break this is exactly, this is a, this is a specimen of something hundreds of millions of years old. I got to be so careful with it. We can't it just replace it. Like, you just see everybody being Please like, oh, break. oh. <laughs> Meanwhile, some of the I paleontologists mean, are like jumping over the pit and stuff. You're like, oh, okay. So they, get a little comfort. they get some comfort with it. But <laughs> I, I remember seeing this one clip. With this, it was like that. It was one dude, and he's like, I don't want to break it. And the dude just like grabs it and kind of just pulls it out of the wall. And I'm like, how long has he been doing this? Yeah, that takes a lot of time and confidence and, and a knowledge of, of, of adhesives and you how you might put it back together. <laughs> it's like, how many bones did you break before you mastered that? <laughs> Just like, wink. I'm like, one of the you know they no. do tell us like obviously you don't want to break it. That's I let's avoid no. that. But I mean, so much of it gets broken and busted with the chipping and the drawing, and, and you know they're they're basically like we've got the things to put it together. Just let us know as soon as something happens. We can wrap it. We can get it. And he, you know, and he's together, and we have the science and the technology. And it's actually usually pretty basic things that we're using to, to glue this all together. But it, it is always funny to watch people on I mean, the first day being like, ah, like sadly, one of the uh Celadonta skulls that I got from fossil crates shipping did something to it in the bottom. Oh, no. was and I was, I was like, ah, oh, darn man. So I just messaged him, he sent me another one. So you got you guys all saying that he didn't do anything. He did. <laughs> so eh, I don't know. I mean, but he was I was just like, I don't know how to fix this. Can, can I fix this? So I just messaged him. I'm like, can I use glue? And he's like, Yeah, I don't, I don't see why you can't. So I just I'm like, boom, solve my problem. Crazy glue. <laughs> it's like, and I'm sure y'all guys use just something similar. I mean, oh yeah, the, the, the number of adhesives that we were like go behind the scenes in the research lab and actually getting to use some of those tools and stuff to be the, the amount of adhesives that they just had 
You know, that's that's its own day. If you wanted, if you're really into it, you could spend a day just learning about what each of those do, the individual roles that they all play, uh, and what you're, or, you know, are you trying to fill the the holes in the bone, or are you trying to glue pieces of bone together? That that's its own thing that I think you could spend a bunch of time and, learning about. And I think that is another fun part of paleontology. If you want to be outside, out in the field, actually digging up the dinosaurs, you can do that. Yep. If you want to be near dinosaurs, but you don't like being outside, you can also you do, do that. that. If you, you want to a microscope a all day, yeah. Like if you just want to sit at a desk and look at dinosaur, that like That's there's there. so much there. I mean, if you want to do like mechanical stuff, you can do like MRIs on them and things. Uh, people like, who get into 3D printing and stuff, they're, yeah, they're I mean, there's very important so in the world much of there. Yeah, that and I mean, it, you can also rediscover dinosaurs. That's the fun part. Oh, well, there's so I much mean, of that. Yeah, and I mean like. It, 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 T-Rex, it probably has been found abundant number of times just because it's one of those most famous dinosaurs. So everybody's always searching for that T-Rex. Of course. And I mean, they shed their teeth like sharks. So you always find like the non, what would be rooted T-Rex teeth probably. And, and I mean, but you're never just like, oh, another t-rex tooth no <laughs> no you're never. Like, i just found a t-rex tooth look at this thing look <laughs> you're like because i mean and i'm surprised i haven't ordered it sooner from fossil crates i just ordered a t-rex tooth a couple days ago because i'm like God, i need one of those for my collection yeah i'm like i needed one of the, i need one of those for my collection i mean uh, somehow i got a mosasaurus tooth bad reflection apparently a Mosasaurus tooth before I got a T Rex tooth. You got a T Rex tooth. I, yeah, and I'm a, I'm a little disappointed in myself that I didn't get that sooner. But I'm also like I'm also a little bit like I understand why I haven't gotten it because I don't want to spend a bunch of my time just talking about those ones that people already know everything about. I want to spend most and. Now, now I'm saying that out loud. I'm reminding myself that I have to go back sometime and make new titles for all my YouTube videos so that they get more views out there. Because right. <laughs> I've recently started doing more creative things. Like with uh, Andrew Sukas, I put like the missing mammal because we only found like the upper jaw of it. Right. And I mean, that's that's another thing. Like the like complete dinosaur skeletons is very rare. Yeah, oh, it but almost it never happens. Is that, that's like one in a million, probably. Yeah, at least, I, yeah. It's probably not even that. It's probably no. even lower than that. Yeah. You find like one-off things, like, oh, I found the foot of a T Rex, but just the foot. I don't know how that works, but we did it. <laughs> and I mean, and I was talking to some people out in the Hell Creek called the Hell Creek Hooligans, and. They were like, oh, yeah, we found Triceratops quite a lot, but not Triceratops feet. Right. And I'm like, that seems very odd. What does so that tell us, you know? You're more likely to find, like, a Triceratops skull than Triceratops feet. And <laughs> but that gets you thinking, that starts to get you thinking about what are the carnivores? Why, why are, you know, why is the one thing that's not, never preserved the feet? What does that say about the environment, the ecosystem that they exist in? But you're you know? look at the bones in the feet. They're so small. They, they're so brittle. I mean, they're they gonna wash they, away, they wash away, they break away. A carnivore bites the foot off and tears it off because maybe it's got like, maybe that's a meteor area. Bones. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it also makes sense. I mean, I feel like personally, I, I'm probably just speaking randomly here. I feel like the skulls are usually, I don't want to say easier to find, but kind of where the dinosaur died. If you find like the skull, that's usually, I feel like it died here, it fell over, and that's where it's fossilized. I mean, a skull, you know, especially for bigger ones, I suppose, you know, just following that, maybe not a little harder to, it's harder to drag off somewhere. Uh, if you're, you know, a carnivore that's looking to do that, or, and, you know, it's maybe not as likely to wash away in a rain as say a pinky finger or whatever. You, you may yeah. Be. I mean, like, uh, we're talking about triceratops. I mean, most of the triceratops skull is bone. Yeah, exactly. And you got what, just the brain in there? Yeah. Maybe some like flesh. So it's also something that it's like, 
it's not really worth going after. No, the carnivores aren't going to go for the face in the same way. You know, they'll eat the eyes and whatever. But, you know, the feet, the underbelly, there's probably a lot more worth like, dragging like around the back than legs, they'd be, They would be tearing those off and dragging yeah. them off. The tail exactly. would be ripping that off. I mean, yeah. chunks of the body, maybe some ribs would be, like, rip, like ripped off and dragged well, That makes away. a lot of sense. Yeah. But, like, the skull for, like, larger creatures like that, like, especially something like maybe an ankylosaur, like, this is... Personally, this is Euoplocephalus, not Ankylosaurus. I do have an Ankylosaurus up here that I got recently. But, I mean, they're so bony and so, like, solid looking that you're like, I don't think that, like, a carnivore would be like, yeah, I'm going to only eat the head. <laughs> it, like, I feel like Ankylosaurus you, was you go probably, for the meat's at. Like, I don't want to say less hunted, but it was probably – harder to hunt just because you can only go at it from the underbelly but that also goes back to those like preservation biases most of like the ankylosaurid skeletons are usually the um like bumps and things like that on the back and it's just like a flat thing mm -hmm. and i mean one of my favorite one is like notosaurus you just like it's just like the flat mat thing I'm like that thing looks like a weird carpet. Exactly. And I've always I've always thought about that. Like I mean clearly like nothing was just like going toe to toe with adult sauropods. Like Allosaurus was tough and all but like a sauropod, I mean it's like it steps on you it's game over. Yeah. It doesn't matter way, how big yeah. you think you are. <laughs> there were very few dinosaurs that hunted like adult sauropods like that. Yeah. Or did things like did things aggressive to them and i mean like and that's part of that preservation bias i mean you don't get that because there was nothing that like it usually it's like oh this one's sick old or it's a young one because of that because it's smaller so things like allosaurus would like just like herd it away and kill it i mean but, like, you get, like, a big bull. Let's go with not even Brachiosaurus. Let's go with, like, Saltosaurus. So it's, like, a mixture of, like, Ankylosaurus and sauropods. Right. It's got those bumps on the back. I mean, like, what is messing with that thing? In my Probably question, adult size, maybe not, not. Maybe nothing. I mean, we, we see it in, in modern wildlife all the time, you know? It's look for the sick, look for the small, look for the slow. And... You see that there's like bumps on the back, and like, so something was messing with things. This thing's back enough to where it evolved to have those bumps. Like, all right, let's get yeah. <laughs> what was that? That that is something that's just really impressive. I mean, you could sit here and talk for like hours and hours and hours about a dinosaur looks this way because of evolution. Yeah, like I mean, the most famous example, T. Rex. Everybody makes fun of the tiny little arms. Ah, yeah, arms. like, but you're like. Well, why did it have those? And it's because the head was so massive. You had the big, like, powerful jaws because it had, like, the strongest bite force of any dinosaur. But to have that, it had to have that big, like, head. But if it had arms, it would just fall on its face. Right. Because it would be too front heavy. Yeah. So it had to have that giant tail that balances it out. I mean, that's part of it. I mean – there's a balancing feature to to evolution. I mean, Always. Look at like humans and gorillas. I mean, I like I give like the average human. I'm putting this lightly. Might be able to out and like out intelligence a gorilla. Sure, <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> I'm using that lightly, but um, I I could give you. Any gorilla against the strongest man, it's going to just destroy him in like an arm wrestling contest. No doubt. No doubt. And, and that is part of that evolutionary thing. We gave up that crazy gorilla strength for intelligence. And, and like, so I feel like sauropods, maybe they gave up. I, I don't imagine them maybe being the fastest, but maybe they gave up that they get, they got massive. A, so predators don't mess with them. B, they gave up that speed because of that. I mean, but they were not the gentle giants that you see everywhere. 
uh, like Argentina source, like the like as as of right now that I'm saying this, as like of I know, they are the biggest land dinosaur out there. Yeah. They're and they lived in herds. Right. One gets it's one wild. gets spooked. That's wild. One gets spooked. What happens? It's going like you look at it like look at it like the like uh like will the beast one gets spooked the whole herd gets spooked and they all run off i mean like like at a watering hole like one zebra gets attacked by a lion or not a lion a alligator all the other ones don't just sit there and keep drinking they all run off so argentinosaurus gets attacked by gigantosaurus or giganotosaurus however you say it i mean one of them gets attacked and it starts like Yelling out to ever all the other ones, and all the other ones are like, "What's going on?" They start getting spooked. You get like a whole like forest just gone, <laughs> right? I mean, we see things like elephants and things like that just knocking over trees. Oh yeah, all the time. I I doubt that a sauropod would have could knock over a tree with minimal effort. One would expect, yeah. I mean, I do not think that it would take them much effort, but <laughs> and I mean. I could only imagine just like the sheer size of like Argentinosaurus and Giganotosaurus, even Spinosaurus. Because sadly, one thing that I do hate about Spinosaurus is that we did have a lot of knowledge on it, but it was obliterated right. by humans. And that's like, I hate seeing that. But it's like, these things are massive. They don't just, because. Like this, this Albertosaurus, I mean, like what I shoved it in my pocket, it don't take much. I mean, but like a real one, it shoves me in its pocket. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, we're, we're like mini figures to them, but that's the other part of it that I, I feel isn't really ever talked on. Like if there was a Jurassic Park would they actively hunt humans? I mean, they're likely not, right? But Yeah, I mean, that would be like humans actively hunting ants. <laughs> it, pro probably not to that. It would be like humans actively hunting like mice, probably, to be more, more accurate. But I mean, the, like, to actually like chase them down, find them, catch them, no, we don't make a huge meal for a T Rex. You're not getting the nutrients that they need. No. They're not getting a lot the, of bone, not a lot of meat. Yeah, I mean, and, and what they eat us in one bite? Like you said, like I remember the T Rex clip. It always eats the goat, and I'm like, I don't think one goat would sustain a T Rex. You know, unless they're treating us like whales treat plankton, where it's just like, as long as I get a lot, I'll, I'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as long as they eat like sixty humans, then you're good. Then it's sustainable. But, and that, that was another thing that I talked about with the Tyrannosaurus. If dinosaurs were reintroduced to the ecosystems, would they actually be able to survive? I mean, evolution is so precise. It seems like, I mean, some might, some, we see it with species in the modern world, right? Some get introduced into completely foreign environments and, and they go off and they thrive and it's perfect for them. Others, uh, no chance. Like, I mean, like some of the large theropods, I hate to say it, but I don't think they could survive if you just like if you put a T Rex out in like just just the woods, it's probably not going to survive. No, because I mean the things that it knew to hunt don't exist anymore. The all its instincts are you know from sixty six. 75, 80 million years ago, um, and completely, you know, our environments might resemble them in some way, but really everything's foreign. Everything that, you know, under the assumption that this thing has, you know, some intrinsic DNA transported knowledge and, and, and instincts, um, it would be like, very unlikely that they would It would have that instinct to hunt. But I feel like... A would it know what to hunt? Yeah. Like a deer? Like one of the most common things that just live... I mean, like, maybe it could catch a moose. Maybe. If it got far enough north. Maybe it could kill a bear. Well, yeah. I don't even say maybe. It could kill a bear. It could. I'm, I'm not even <laughs> doubting that. But, like, could it catch the bear? Would it know to 
it would have no idea what to do with these things. You well, know? Would it hunt? Would it actively hunt the bear? Like, yeah. But like a deer, I don't think. I think like if it got the chance to, it could easily kill a deer. But I don't think it could catch it. Is the thing because all these niches that all these other dinosaurs have filled for the longest time, specifically designed to do that. Yeah, I mean, they've been filled up by new mammals that have filled in new yeah, niches that exactly. have exactly kind of evolved differently. I mean, I, like I, like how deer are so abundant, I feel like uh, hadrosaurs were kind of like that. It hadrosaurs seems that were, way, yeah. We're kind of like the deer of the... Uh, yeah, I've heard Jurassic. them called the cows of the era as well, like, too. So. I, I feel like the dinosaurs that would like easily survive would be a a depending on where you put them b depending on like other creatures in the ecosystem like i feel like if you put a hadrosaur in like a fern heavy ecosystem they could survive yeah that makes some sense but if you put them in like the savanna of africa they're gonna die i mean yeah they're not gonna find what they need and that was one of the most like things that i saw in the uh Jurassic World Dominion, they showed the uh, – I don't even think it was a Triceratops, which I applaud them for that. They showed, like, Sinoceratops, mm. which was – I'm like, hey, they're showing new dinosaurs other than the basic couple. I mean, good, good job. At least we got that. Let's do more of that. Go, go show some light and love to the other ones. But, like, they showed it in, like, Africa grazing with, like, elephants. But I'm like, grass didn't exist. Exactly. What, what are they? They don't know what to do. They with don't know grass. what to do with Their grass. Their body's not digest grass. It's not digesting it. Well, also, to be fair, again, that is me harping on Jurassic Park and all that because everybody likes to hate yeah. on it. It's like, oh, it's not scientifically accurate. To be fair, they did answer that in the movie. They are not complete dinosaurs. They have uh, instincts and DNA of frogs and the lizards modern animals, and other yeah. things and thing. so to be fair those dino- dinosaurs technically they're not even dinosaurs they're just they're actually technically they're new species altogether they would be mm-hmm. but i feel like those could survive but that's because they would have some weird locked out instinct or some weird other genetic factor from whatever random creature they added in to complete the genome but like an actual dinosaur, if you were to put it in like the grasslands of Africa, it's not going to survive. No. It, and another thing that I found really weird was grass was like a hundred million years ago. Grass, yeah, that's hoppers, crazy. Grasshoppers were like three hundred million years ago. Oh, I didn't know that. I had no idea. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, wait. So how are they grasshoppers if there's no grass? Or they were they some other hopping? kind of. They were they were a different hopper before they became the specified grasshopper. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's a it's a funny joke that I saw. I mean, they're like grass. It's like so how how are grasshoppers hopping grass before grass? They had grass to hop. <laughs> it's like imagine the first grasshopper seeing grass. It's like. Finally. <laughs> like, we are going to hop you. I have been what? waiting for this moment. <laughs> this is what I was built for. I have been made for this. <laughs> it's like, I don't, it's like, whoa. I mean, and that, that goes back to like, that, that like, uh, time scales. Looking at that, like the last mammoths were, um, were like during Egypt. Yeah, yeah, they they were building the pyramids at the same time the mammoths were roaming. I mean, granted, they weren't like abundant in Siberia, but, but they still existed. Yeah, they still existed, and it was like a little pocket island on there that 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 just like had them. So I mean, they were still there, and that also makes me think: what other species were up there? Was it just um, mammoths, or was it? Were there other things like possibly a lasmotherium or other? Right. Oh, sorry, I was wrong. 
So grasses were 55 million years ago. Yeah, grasses were post-dinosaur. They were 55 million years ago. So for those of you who want to see where I'm getting this from, here is, this is from nationaljournal.com. It says 55 million years ago, or the uh, first thing, as of November 17th, 2005. So granted, that's probably also give or take all of human existence, but that that's still like like that. I mean, but then you also have grasshoppers more than 300 million years ago. Crazy. So it's like, it's how crazy. are we calling them grasshoppers? I don't think they count as grasshoppers. I don't think that's how they would self-identify 300 million years ago. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They're not like, we're not grass. They're like, what is grass? You made that up. <laughs> we just took advantage once. What is grass? <laughs> I mean, I mean, but like little things like that, it's so interesting that like ancient grasshoppers probably don't look like modern ones. Of course, no. They, they, wouldn't they, weren't, they weren't, they didn't have grass. No, exactly. I mean, that, that's, that's the big thing. I mean, yeah, there, there's, I mean, there's no way they're going to be built the same way. Their environment really? uh, is completely different. It has, it has changed entirely. I mean, there's so much to that. I mean, prehistoric insects were massive. I mean, like the uh, giant centipedes and things like that. That oh boy. And I remember going back and watching prehistoric part with uh, Nigel Marvin. And it was one of the jokes, and they went back to get some of uh, the ancient bugs. And one of the guys is like, they set up their tent and. <laughs> He's putting up a mosquito net, and he's like, "Oh, those don't exist yet. You don't got to worry about that." <laughs> They're it's not like, coming he's along. Like, like, huh? He's like, "I never really thought about that." But I'm also like, "Could they just like not continue to not exist?" I don't like mosquitoes. No, I don't think uh, many people are fan of mosquitoes. They, they, I mean, I, they, they certainly fill a niche, but uh, have been not ideal. <laughs> not ideal. <laughs> no, I think we can uh, obliterate that niche. Niche. We're good. We can. And I, I mean. This is just going off topic, but there was – I forgot which country it was. But they had released, like, a bunch of mosquitoes that don't bite to start breeding with mosquitoes that do bite to cause, like, all mosquitoes to just stop biting people. I saw that. Yeah. I read like, a little bit about that. Huh. And, and it's, like, one of those things because we always hear this selective breeding term for, like, dogs and cats and horses and things like that. I mean – The domesticated. I never thought of it for, like – just out in the wild for creatures like that. I mean, I yeah, know I was, I was, I was hearing about that or reading about that somewhere too. It was interesting. And, and that's like another thing. I mean, some of the like horses were tiny. Horses were fairly, humans could not ride on horses. No, horses they were, were tiny, tiny for a long, long time. Yep. And humans like selectively bred them to be larger and be able to ride on them and to be able to like, I mean, even like, in between breeds of horses, they fill different roles. I mean, the bigger ones are usually uh, for like pulling wagons and things like that. And the smaller ones usually are quicker and used for war and riding on and things like that. Although I don't think we use them for war anymore. Probably kind of, not for the most kind, part. Kind of, kind of outdone by cars. I mean, <laughs> and, and another thing that makes me really mad that I don't know who came up with the term horsepower, but one horse is not one horsepower. <laughs> you don't feel it's a compatible unit. Uh, it's like, a comparable I unit. They measure horses in hands. I'm like, <laughs> imagine, imagine. Let's start. I'm gonna start measuring sauropods in hands. And I'm like, it's only fair. Yeah, like it's 600 hands tall. It's like, wow. But it's also like, I don't know what that means. Okay, but we measure everything in feet. But feet aren't a foot long. Actually, my zag and a hand I don't think was a foot long, was a, a specific hand length either. But I, I mean, maybe somebody's foot, whoever came up with the term, it's usually foot, some king's hand long. or foot. Because I mean, to be fair, my shoe size is like an 11, so I'm oh, my foot is almost a foot long, right? <laughs> so it's almost, it's almost living up to that standard, but I mean. That's another thing, just the size of like sort like sauropods. Like you can go to like um 
pull my notebook back up. Let's just uh, momentous source. I don't know. I actually have a uh, what is it? So one of the other things that I got recently was a PSNO Baryonyx. I don't know if you've heard of the company, but I've had a, a momentous source. They do a lot with uh, like dinosaur size sizes and things, and they're fairly accurate from what I've seen. And I actually got a momentous source, but it's up on my shelf. It's almost worth knocking everything over to get. <laughs> keyword being almost but i mean momentous source you're like oh it's 80 feet long and 35 feet tall i can and you're like whoa that's massive but you're also like what is that exactly i don't know what to compare that to right. but if you're like oh yeah it's about as tall as like a two to three story building you're like then you get that comparison you're like that thing is massive I feel like we often measure dinosaurs in, in terms of school buses. Seems to be a, a going unit. School buses and elephants. Elephants. That's the, that's the two things. Those are the things we know that are big and we can compare. Yeah, I mean, elephants are like the current largest land mammal. So you're like, this thing was like 45 elephants. You're like, what? Even though, what's that as a concept? Like, well, I can't. <laughs> I don't, what is that as a concept? Elephants? And it, it gives you that like term though. I mean, because I can say this thing is like, 80 tons but what does that mean yeah and i always that is something that i always i should probably start doing this more in episodes where i give that more comparison to something right because i'm always just like brachiosaurus is 50 feet tall and it's like well what does that mean like i don't really know how tall 50 feet is yeah no who does it's not something that we think about it's not a concept we have a lot of the time yeah i mean like it's just something that's like there, but it's like, um, I, it's like, I don't know what to like compare that to. I mean, cause even with like smaller, I feel like smaller dinosaurs are a little bit different. Cause if you're like, Oh, Velociraptor, it's the size of a chicken. Right. And, and almost everybody's seen a chicken. Well, actually a lot of people, probably I think have, most but, people have seen a chicken. Mo- have most context people, for a chicken. Yeah, yeah, have some kind of context for a chicken or something chicken sized or have some kind of relation to that. And you get that fair comparison. But I mean, as you slowly get larger, because it's also like, oh, well, this one's short, but it's like, like, uh, ankylosaurus, they're short, but they are hefty. Right. So I'm like, I don't see this thing doing a lot of like, 40 mile per hour sprinting. <laughs> right. It's probably like doing like a light. I mean, ball. if it can sprint 40, it's not doing, you can tell by, you know, what, how that animal's, what it's got for defense um, and protection that it probably ain't a sprinter because it doesn't, Again, you know, that's, that, that's not the way it evolved. That's a, that's like evolution. It's exactly. Like, I'm not fast, but you but can't I hit me and I'm going to knock your bottom jaw off. Exactly. I mean, and I mean, even I was, I was talking to, uh, my uh who was it was it my it was in a physics class but it was i don't i'm trying to remember their name but i don't even remember who it was he like left the school or whatever i mean um but i was he was like oh he was talking about like a fighter jet and he's like wow humans were the first creatures to make that sonic boom and i'm like wrong ever heard of an apotosaurus i mean like like that like that was something that was like flabbergasting for me. I mean, cause you're like breaking the sound barrier. That sounds so complicated and only humans could do it. You need that technology, but then you get like a pot of source where you get the end of the tail. Uh, I think I have it. Could break the sound barrier by whipping its tail, causing a sonic boom, got, causing a sonic boom going over like, uh, Marsh in 1877. Of course, Marsh discovered it. <laughs> well, those people. Um, the tip of its tail could move at more than 800 miles per hour, causing a small sonic boom. Wow, I had no, I did not know that. I had no idea of that. And it's like, you're telling me a creature like just figured that out one day? Like, imagine just like. Like moving your hand like that, like doing a snap, and it's just like, you're like and the and uh, the the physics uh, and the physiology that has to 
come together to make that possible over evolution. It's, it's, it's incredible. It, it is like, and not even that, because, and I almost don't do it justice by just going like T-Rex or right. Pachyrhinosaurus or whatever, because there's other like, because that's like the genus. Right. There's like other species under that. Like oh, they, I did an episode uh, on Pachyrhinus. I mean, like most of them are like, they look very similar, but they like one's got like a horn in the center of his crest. The other one's got like the crest is shaped slightly different. And then another one is like, just like the bare bones doesn't have that or it doesn't have the crest. And it's like, you, you got like the different species and things like that. And you got all kinds of different, and you can like break it up even deeper than that. And I mean, like, that's another impressive thing. Cause you know, a brachiosaurus, like in Montana, that was walking around in Montana may not have met a brachiosaurus that was walking around in Utah. No, of course. And the environments were not the exact same. I mean, they could have been very similar, but they were not the exact same. No, so that's, you know, that's something would have that's been exciting different. to consider is, is just these differences between things that were so close in, in from our own geography, but not really in a realistic way. So, because I mean, the fact that like species like that were like mixed up so commonly, I feel like says something. Like, honestly, I've I've seen like a Camarasaurus and a Brachiosaurus skull. I'm like, they look very similar. Oh, I mean, I'm impressed by what what people can deduce. You know, what paleontologists are able to deduce from things that uh, I'm surprised we're still not. I mean, conflating them or or, or whatever it may be. You know, and I feel like the Camarasaurus Tarbusaurus version is like the uh, sauropod version of the Tarbusaurus. Tyrannosaurus. They look very similar, and they they look. I don't want to say active, but they were very similar creatures. But one was like smaller and had a slightly different skull, and that's like, well, yeah. And I mean, and all this new stuff about Nano Tyrannus. I mean, people are like, was it its own species or? Was it a juvenile T Rex? Although I think it's like one dude saying that now. So okay, and, and they're all like, everybody's like, no, it's its own species. You, you in particular, that one guy just needs to stop. But I mean, going back to uh, Clayton, the dinosaur, dinosaur cowboy. I don't know why I blanked on that. He's got like a very generic name, and I just keep blanking on it all the time. He he invited me out to like the um. Gr- I don't want to say grand opening because I'm pretty sure the museum's been open, but they're unveiling a fossil discovery that he found. And he was talking about it and he was like, this will either determine if uh, Nano Tyrannus is juvenile T-Rex or its own species. And he's like, although we've already found enough specimens to say that it's its own species, but this is like the, the cut moment. And it, and they found it and he's like, yeah, on the other side of that is called the dueling dinos, so it's clearly two dinosaurs. We found a new ceratopsian, and I'm like, I, I'm like, can I come? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just like so stoked for that, and I'm like, because it's just like one of those things that it's like a one in a lifetime opportunity. Oh yeah, for sure. And and, and I'm glad that you that you're doing your company for more than one year because. And I, I hope that like next year, Dr. Brian Curtis will do more because sadly, I don't think I can make it this year because of schooling because I think he said his were in March. Uh, May. Like, we're doing May 2nd through 10th. We're doing Route 66 million years ago. That's the Arizona, California. And then May 13th to 20th, we're doing our Red Rocks and Raptors, Colorado, Utah trip. So they're nine days and eight days, respectively, that he'll be leading on those. And this summer yeah. in July, we're out in Alberta and uh, Montana in August as well. So, yeah. So, A, I need to figure out when I get out of school. Maybe I can come. Maybe, maybe I can't, sadly. <laughs> That's just one of those things. I mean, but if he does it next year, is that's like something that is like. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, we, we've we got can't. a great partnership going. I expect he'll be leading trips for us for some time. So. Oh, yeah. I really hope so because that – no, no. I was going to say that's like – that might be one of the only opportunities I get to meet him. But, yeah, I'm definitely going to like – I've talked to so many people out like Montana and stuff. I'm just like 
as soon as I can, I'm just going to go out there for like two or three months and just drive around and meet all these people. Oh yeah, we're going to be out there in Montana a bunch as years come on. We're working on some projects out there. and But yeah, for yourself, we'd love to get you on a trip uh, as, as soon as possible one of these days for your, for your viewers, your listeners. You know, make sure they come out and they can also, you know, I should mention um, before we're done here, if they mention that they heard about this on prehistoric life on, on, on your channels, um, we'll give them 250 bucks off too for their next trip. So uh, yeah, just uh, mention that this is where you, you heard about the trips and, and hopefully, you know, I guess it can't get you up for May, but even maybe get you up to Alberta this summer, Montana, something along those lines. We'd love I, to have you. I'll have to find something. And that actually leads me on to another thing, which is another sponsorship. I mean, so for all of you that have been listening through the month of January, Fossil Crates is doing a, I call it a sponsorship. It's not technically, but a promotion. A it's a niche. But I mean, if you guys want a Velociraptor claw from Fossil Crates and y'all guys are buying a crate, use use code prehistoric life and he will personally throw in a free Velociraptor claw. So nice. y'all guys go do that. I mean, <laughs> I, I use it. I mean no it's great and fossil crates are great and uh, yeah, i really i love this pod i love what you've been doing and i i, I want to thank you for for having me on this has been a lot of fun chatting with you about i this. want to thank you for coming on like i do, i feel so weird getting like thanked by people because i'm like i'm not really i feel like i'm not really doing that i'm like you're creating you a space to talk about me. paleontology you're creating a space for people to talk mm -hmm. about their passions what they care about it's a lot of fun because i've got people outside like i have um uh, this is one person she just walked up to me and she's like yeah i got a buddy out in utah he's like he he wants to get in contact with you i, I as soon as the next time i see you i'm gonna give you his contact information he wants to come on the show and i'm like yes thank you <laughs> let's do yeah, this it's, <laughs> like, it's great it's uh, it yeah. seems like you're having a lot of fun with it you're going to talk about something that you're passionate about and and for people like myself you know get a chance to expand that community bring more people into the dinosaur trips world and uh, you know this this conversation that we've been having here on this podcast is is what dinner, what breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the time spent on the on on the bus in between the places we go or in the truck is is all about. It's you know, getting into these ideas, getting into these theories, tossing things around. It's a lot of fun. So this 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 feels like part of that. And I, I don't personally know how it feels to create a company because I haven't done that, <laughs> but I feel like I know a little a little bit because I've started this podcast and that's kind of a. I don't want to say it's the exact same, but oh, no, it's, it's, it's you're building on something you're passionate about. You're building an audience. It's similar for sure. And there, there are some sleepless nights to get that work done, <laughs> get the research in, get all that. Cause a couple nights ago I had to pull an all nighter finishing some research on something for an episode that actually, if I'm not mistaken, will actually be the same week that this episode is released. Yep. It will be the exact same week. I'll just, Move back to that Friday. I mean, get this one up first because I want, I want this one up first. But I mean, there's it, it, there's so much to look, at and I I I have to like cut myself off sometimes because I I'll get too carried away, and I'm like, all right, I get one hour to look at this, and then it's like, oh, I'm like halfway done with the research. Oh, it's been three hours. <laughs> well, you can deep dive with uh, us. You can go nine, eight days, nine days, two weeks. That that is something we, that, go, we go hard on it. So. That is something that I definitely got to do. I got to get out there, and because also if I get out to Montana, maybe if I can convince my family we could stay a few days and go out and meet some of the people that I've done interviews with, and just go talk with them too, and that would be just like an actual like my ultimate dinosaur experience because. I get to go to all these amazing museums with, with your company and I get to meet people with your company and Dr. Brian Curtis. I mean, I get to meet him too on top of while I'm in Montana, like why not just like, cause I've been, I think I have 12 interviews up now. Don't, don't quote me on that. I don't know if that's true, but I mean, I would love to actually go out and meet these people and talk to them. Cause I've had a lot of them. They're like, and we need to get you out there and out here and do some dinosaur digs. I mean, I personally have not started the official journey to becoming that paleontologist and going to college and getting that, but I've already That's got that. You've, I'm already getting my friends that. down. I'm already yeah. building my network, trying to get people. I mean, and that's all I ask for is that like, I, I try to stay in touch with people because I never know when I'll need them. I mean, I, one day I'm like, maybe 
I pr I pray, I make a big discovery. I open a museum out there, and you're like, hey, there's a cool museum between these two that I can add to a trip. And I'm like, you're like, ah, oh, who owns it? And you're like, oh, it's that dude that I did that episode with That'd for his great. podcast. <laughs> and you just, I mean, we just have that relationship. And I, you just shoot me a message. You're like, I see you got a museum open. I mean, and I'm like, let's go. Bring your people. Bring your people right now. I mean, and I would love for that. I mean, that that is. And I feel like for not all of them, but most paleontologists, that is the end goal. That is the end dream. To have your own museum, your own name on a museum, your own collection out there for people to see. And that is definitely my end dream, my end goal. I mean, I say end goal, but that's like the start of it. <laughs> There's so much stuff after that. But I mean, I hope that maybe whenever I sadly retire from digging up dinosaur bones, I have my own big enough collection. I'm just like... I got money too. I'm hoping for that. I'm like, I'm opening up this warehouse and I'm just putting all the bones out in it. <laughs> well, uh, you're on the right, you're on the right start. I think for it with this podcast and this passion for it. Um, you know, it's a, I expect I'll be hearing from you a lot more as dinosaur oh. trips evolves and as you evolve on your journey in paleontology as well. So that was, uh, I mean, it, <laughs> my goal is definitely to stay in contact on oh, that closet. No. Okay. Um, my goal is definitely to stay in contact, but because I'm hoping to come on one of the trips. Oh, we got very, we're definitely getting you on a trip one of these days very soon. For all the people that are curious, dinosaur trips, the website, just www. You don't even have to do that. Just go dinosaur dinosaur trips. Trips .com. Google dinosaur trips. We'll pop up right off. So that that is the right website, right? That is correct. <laughs> I don't want to make a fool of myself, but no, that's us. Is, that's us. And I don't know. Maybe, maybe for some reason you're strange and going on trips for museums and seeing really cool dinosaurs isn't your thing for some reason. And you just want to see stuff about it on Instagram. Go check out. Yeah, that way. Their Instagram is dinosaur is. trips. And hey, I mean, while you're at it, go, go. I always want to encourage that you don't just follow me and what I do because I'm wrong. Sometimes I don't give the full story, but some of these amazing people like, Oh, there's so many great people. I mean, I always try to encourage that you go look at their work too, to go support them. So yeah, no, don't it's a great just community. Follow. I mean, like while you're at it, while it loads, actually, I think something, no one that pulled up. Go follow Fossil Crates too. I mean, really amazing dude. He has a really amazing stuff. He's got some um, what are they called? Scaled skulls coming out February first. What is that? That keeps popping up. <laughs> <laughs> the technical difficulties. I mean, love technology, but it's a pain sometimes. And while you're at it, clearly you heard about me somewhere. So probably through Instagram because that's kind of my only platform besides some other things but hey go go check me out on instagram too i post some stuff and I, that's where i kind of post all the stuff about what episodes are doing things i occasionally put a little poll up on my story asking what's your favorite dinosaur just because i want to like that, that's gonna get annoying real quick <laughs> <laughs> but i mean because i always do that because i mean and I, and I beg for y'all to do that because that doesn't – that's not just me asking what's your favorite dinosaur. That's also telling me like, oh, if six out of 12 people are saying specific theropods, I'm like I shouldn't focus on hadrosaurs and ceratopsians. I should focus on theropods for a while because y'all want to see theropods. And that lets me know that. And I, I'm sure you probably have some experience with that kind of thing too. I mean – and while you're at it, I mean – for uh, it, blah, blah. on YouTube, I post things early. I try to post things early, and there's sky right there. I mean, uh, as you can see, this is coming out, and actually, this is out already. Oh yeah, I did two episodes. Mm, a little spoiler. Um, but like my interview with Dr. Brian Curtis. I mean, it may have been shorter, but it's there still. I mean, and I'm definitely getting him back on the show sometime. So I post everything a little bit earlier there, usually two days in advance, and. All that and while you're checking that out, I mean, nope, so much stuff I gotta pull up. <laughs> I mean, 
if you just want one location for all that, go check out my website along with the uh, dinosaur trips. I was about to say fossil trips again. <laughs> but from there, you can get to the YouTube and the Instagram. I mean, why not check that out? It's one location. And clearly, if you stayed this long, you like my podcast. <laughs> I hope you're not hate listening because that's mean. But go check it out. That's just where everything is. I mean, I even if you go down to the bottom. You just got my Instagram page right there. And I did an episode with I Know Dinosaurs. And I'm trying to reach out because I know you guys love these interviews. So I try to reach out to people like – like uh back here from dinosaur trips. I mean, he gives his insight to what he doesn't just talk about. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Just talking about dinosaurs, but he talks about how he finds dinosaurs, how he plans the trips to see all these museums and things like that. And I do have a treat for y'all later this month. I have an interview with the why dinosaur documentary people. So nice. Let's go, go be on the lookout for that. But I mean, I do encourage y'all don't just look at my stuff, look at their stuff too. I mean, I want y'all to support them. Go check them out too. I mean, cause I'm trying to build that community. I mean, so go be nice to them. Go, go give them a like and a follow. And if you're interested in seeing these museums, go visit dinosaurtrips.com and plan your thing. Like he said, if you use prehistoric life, you get $250 off. Yeah. Just mentioned that you heard him. Just, just saying. It's totally worth it. And while you're at it, if you're buying stuff, might as well get a crate from Fossil Crates. Get a free well. Velociraptor claw. I mean, there's some cool crates on there, man. I mean, oh, yeah. But it's been an honor talking to you. And I'm so thankful that you took time out of your day to just come talk. I mean, I uh, appreciate it. It's, uh, I'm immediately going from this back into working on the trips. Um, so it's a lot, of, it's a lot of fun and yeah, no, I appreciate, appreciate you having the time for me and the getting the, getting a chat with you. Uh, it was really fun. So man, I'm in, I'm gonna go ahead and play the outro and I'll definitely stay in touch. All right. Do that. Look forward so, to it. I'm your host, Eric Crawford. That's Zach from Dinosaur Trips. This has been Prehistoric Life Podcast. Remember, keep it prehistoric. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.